that's called Race for the Ages. Okay. And this race Sounds right up your alley. Go on. <laughs> it's been created just for um, old runners, you know. Well, you know, n none of us are old. We're all right. What's considered old? Yeah. Old by life, but there's a lot of biologically young, chronologically old, right? Uh, which are marathon runners out there, and so they've created a race just for us now. Uh, and uh, I've, you know, since I've been in the news a lot and stuff like that, I, I've uh, uh, been able to arrange for several different film documentary crews to come and actually film the race. Oh, nice! So uh, it's going to be, it's going to be make a lot of big news, and it's coming up. God, I want to say in uh, September. You know, I have to check on that. How long is the race? How long is it? It's it's weird. It's you're supposed to run the number of years you're the number of miles that equals your age. So I would have to run 63 miles. But I I I don't think I'd want to stop at that point. That's and cake for you, right? That's a piece of cake. It's a it's a well you know, last weekend I did a hundred mile race and oh. only made it 58 miles before I crashed. Only you know, only 58. It's all relative. It was really yeah. Well, my wife kicked my butt. She 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 made it 80 miles, but she didn't wow. finish. She, it was a really, really tough race. Lots of mud, you know, that kind of stuff that uh, made it going up hills like really you're slipping down and stuff. It's just an awful, awful experience. But um, <clears throat> so 63, I mean, it's a one mile loop and that kind of stuff bores the hell out of me. Mm, yeah. So you're not like seeing new scenery. It's just over and over. Yeah. I, I've tried that one time before and I actually made it 62 miles. I, I, I you know, it's about 50 miles. I just said, boy, I can't have do another lap it's just so boring so i decided to stop at 100 kilometers which is 62 miles now this race i'm going to have to do one lap further but i think the the fact that it's for aging is for is to promote the idea that that there's a lot of old athletes that are very athletic and, yeah. and still healthy i think that's going to motivate me to, to go many many miles and i I, yeah. I hope they allow me to go and do a typical 100 mile race yeah 100 miles so what is the age that starts at like how old do you have to be to to be in this race i don't know but i assume it's probably 50 50 and over yeah it's like i could i could bring up the website right now yeah. i wonder uh, how old is the oldest person who's doing it you know shoot i don't know if we have time but we haven't started yet when, no right? no i mean let me just bring it up and find out okay it's called race bring it up on my other screen race for the ages what i got you are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm very excited. We have Dr. William Andrews, who's one of the top longevity experts in the world and is a man on a mission to reverse aging and has been since he was 10 years old, which we will talk about. Dr. Andrews is the founder of the biotechnology company, Sierra Sciences. He's worked in the biotech industry for over 34 years, focused on extending the human lifespan. He has a PhD in molecular and population genetics and was a senior scientist and director at several large corporations. Uh, in 1997, he led the team at Jaron Corporation to be first to successfully identify human telomerase and was awarded second place as the National Inventor of the Year. Dr. Andrews, Bill, thanks for joining me. Yes. Thank you. I will call you Bill because um, yes. you, you uh, demanded it. And we will get into, if, no, if people don't know what human telomerase is or telomeres, we will get into that too. But I always like to start a, a fun fact and an amazing fun fact about you is you're an ultra marathon runner and you run races as long as 138 miles. What's been your longest longest race so far? That is 138 miles. Um, that was a race. I've you know, entered it twice, only completed it once, but wow. there's a whole movie about why I didn't finish the first time. But uh, um, why? The, it, it, I, at 50 miles, I ended up getting a gallbladder attack. Holy cow. I'm in the 
you know, top of the Himalayas of northern India and uh, had to be uh, sent to a hospital that <laughs> was the last thing I would ever call a hospital. I remember being almost, you know, passing out and stuff like that. Wow. Uh, I was really sick and I remember actually a cow walked through my room. Uh, that's what kind of hospital I was in. And when I got, when I got well enough to be transported, they flew me to uh, uh, Delhi, uh, where I thought that was like the best hospital I've ever seen in the entire world. Really? That was an incredibly good hospital. Uh, and I ended up staying there for two weeks before I, because my doctor here in the United States wouldn't let me uh, the, uh, it wouldn't let me have surgery there and he wouldn't let the doctors there do it. Mm -hmm. So they waited till I was well enough to fly and they flew me back to the United States. I went straight to my doctor's office and he did an exam on me and said, get in the hospital fast. <laughs> and he, wow. they, they took my gallbladder out and, and the doctor who took the gallbladder out said, boy, it was so bad he didn't understand how I was even conscious. But, uh, but that, that ended up happening is 50 miles. I, I knew something was wrong. Uh, I was actually like running downhill and suddenly getting really weak. My crew had to pick me up and uh, I thought maybe I was uh, breathing problems or something like that because yeah. of the high altitude. But they, they finally, uh, I, I was sitting there in their car while I was waiting to recover from the misery and all of a sudden it just got really painful. I yelled at them, take me to the hospital quick. Wow. Uh, so I, I ended up finishing that, not finishing that race, but my wife, she actually made it 100 miles in the race. Wow. Uh, and then, then she was told by the race director that I was in the hospital and not doing well. And so she pulled from the race at the time, too, uh, to come be with me. But she went back next year and finished the race. And I went back the year after that and finished the race. And it's a really incredible race. Both of us, that's our favorite race in the world, <laughs> you, can't, you know, ignoring the hospitals and stuff. But uh, right. it's uh, 138 miles yeah. nonstop in the Himalayas of northern India at 18,000 feet elevation. Wow. And uh, it's uh, a lot of training you have to do for it. And it's an incredible experience, incredible adventure. How uh, long does it take you? How long does it take well, when you finish? That race, I mean, it's a little slower pace than normal because of the altitude. But yeah. it took me 51 straight hours. Wow. That's all day, all night, all day, all night, and three more hours. Jeez. Took my wife 59 hours. Wait, that's all day, all night, all day, all night, and 11 more hours. And do you, at any point, do you stop or, or do you just keep going? <laughs> you stop every once in a while. To eat. Now, I did stop. I thought I was having some heart issues at about 90. I would have heart issues. with. <laughs> if you don't, I think something's wrong with you. I was at the lowest altitude of the race, and suddenly I was reduced to a walk. And uh, it wasn't even uphill. And so <clears throat> I, I so said, okay, something's wrong with me. I need a doctor. And so I, I was put inside this little like Adobe building out in the middle, you know, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. And they went and got a doctor and the doctor examined me and said I was okay. Uh, and uh, the funny thing was, as soon as I got out of that little village, I suddenly felt okay too. Uh, and that's, that's, that's all shown in the documentaries. There's two documentaries, one called The Immortalist, yeah. Netflix right now, and the other one's called The High. Uh, and uh, that's just got mm. launched uh, just uh, this month. And uh, in both of them, they talk about that. But it, it's, I, I, in hindsight now, the fact that I started feeling better as soon as I got out of there is I realized that I was having an allergic reaction to something in the air mm. there. And so, because as soon as I got out of town, I was running up. I ran up the next 18,000 foot peak at a, at a fairly fast pace um, <clears throat> and then came back down to the finish line. Uh, and, uh, but, but so that I did stop that one time and I would say that my stop was probably an hour. I probably stopped for an hour. Um, and uh, I don't think I ever fell asleep during that time because I was so concerned about my health at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I did, I slept very well after the race. <laughs> What's your eating and drinking regimen while you're running? Oh, I'm I'm a big believer in uh, balancing the calories with the amount of calories you burn. Typical runner or walker or anybody burns 100 calories per mile. Mm -hmm. So I try to take 100 calories per mile. And that's mm -hmm. equivalent to one packet of goo every mile. I typically keep my GPS beeping 
Uh, so every, every, every mile it beeps and I say, I take a packet of goo. Uh, and uh, I have, it's, I know most people can't do that. I've just got a rock solid stomach and I love goo. <laughs> and, uh, do you have a certain goo that works well for you? I, I, I do all the flavors. Okay? Yeah. My favorite is the um, um, vanilla bean. Is it actually called goo? Like what is the actual? Oh, okay, so goo is little packets of gel that come in the size of a right. credit card. Right, yeah. And I carry like 10 of them with me at a time. Yeah. <clears throat> and so every 10 miles, I, my crew would restock me with more. Um, and then, then I, you know, I, I also drink lots of water. I'm a big believer in, in trying to keep up with like 10 ounces of water per mile. Mm -hmm. So I carry a camelback. 10 ounces of water is a lot. And so, and a lot of people say it's impossible to drink that much, but I prove them wrong all the time. But I balance it very well with electrolytes because the biggest problem with drinking water is you're diluting your sodium and potassium and magnesium. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so I take electrolytes. I used to make my own. And then a company called Salt Stick came out with electrolytes that pretty much matched the ratios of the salts that I used to use. Hmm. And, so, and now I just buy them from my buy all my electrolytes from Salt Stick. Salt Stick. Oh. S A L T S T I C K. Yeah. And uh, Bill, how'd I, you get into this? How'd you get into this ultra marathon? Well, stuff? I've been a runner all my life. Um, I mean, I, I competed in my first endurance race when I was ten years old. Um, my brother, I have an identical twin brother. Really? And, Holy and, cow. And he and I were in a, a, a something, some like class or something like that for kids at the Los Angeles Athletic Club. And uh, so <clears throat> every Saturday, my father would take us there for training and, you know, boxing and diving and swimming. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things was running. And then one day it was announced that we were going to have a big uh one mile endurance race. And uh, so it was around a, a track that was 10th of a mile long indoors. Um, and we were all like, oh my God, we're gonna run a whole mile? That's <laughs> impossible. Uh, but it was, amazingly, my brother and I <clears throat> lapped third place uh, twice before finishing. And- uh, You just had a knack for it. And that's when we discovered that we were endurance runners. And so I've been running endurance, but we always, both my brother and I were always the type that would never stop running. We were really fortunate to have parents that never told us, don't run, you know? You know, it, it's like, uh, so we, we ran everywhere. And I remember even in high school, um, <clears throat> you know, I would run to lunch. I would run back to my dorm room. I used to live in a, a boarding school. Uh, I would run everywhere. Uh, it just didn't make sense mm. to walk. Have you uh, seen McFarland, the movie McFarland? Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 But, uh, That's what that, I picture. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, uh, uh, the, it, it's, there are some people that are natural runners. Now, I was never as fast as those kids in uh, McFarland, but uh, I, I could always do the distance. Yeah. There was never, there was enough, you know, I remember when I lived in Lake Arrowhead, uh, which is in Southern California, uh, I remember one time my brother and I just said, hey, let's, let's go run around Lake Arrowhead. And we found it really simple to do. I don't know how many miles. That was probably like 20 miles or something wow, like that. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I ran cr cross country and track in high school and uh, uh, a little bit in college. But even, even in graduate school, I was doing a lot of running, like marathons and stuff like that on my own. Yeah. Now, you uh, are doing the Race for the Ages coming up. Yeah, the Race for the Ages. is. I'm very excited about this race. It's, it's a race for old people. <laughs> Let's say... It's, it's a race for chronologically chron old people, biologically young. Biologic, yeah, right. Yeah. right. And that's where I fit myself. So how in. long is the race? Is that one? Uh, it's, it's actually you run the number of miles that your, your age is. Okay, so I'm 63, so I have to run 63 miles. Yeah. Uh, 63 miles is short for me, so I'll probably continue on if they let me, and I'll probably go for 100 miles. Wow. Uh, but there's an incredible number of runners in the race I've I mean, this is going to be uh, this. This is going to be well publicized. I can't wait for it to come up. It's actually going to be September second, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of this year. And it's in uh, shoot, I can't remember where it is, but I think it's Tennessee. I'll link it up. I'll link it up. You know, what's interesting is, and we'll talk about some of the advancements of anti-aging because I know one of your goals is to run a seven-minute mile when you're 130 years old. 
So I want to hear about some of the research that's going to get you there. Um, what are you most excited about lately with the advancements of anti-aging? Uh, well, of course, it's the telomere stuff. Yeah. Um, I think the I, there's a lot of things that cause us to age. I like to think of them as sticks of dynamite that are burning inside of us. And, right. and which stick of dynamite has the shortest fuse is the most important one, <clears throat> but it's not the only one. And so I think telomeres are the stick of dynamite with the shortest fuse for people that lead healthy, healthy lifestyles. Now, smokers and obese people, they have high oxidative stress problems. And so mm-hmm. oxidative stress is probably their shortest fuse. Yeah. The stick of dynamites, and so they just need to get themselves healthy with, and they could be taking antioxidants will help a bit, but not completely. They got to quit smoking and lose weight mm-hmm. to get them back into where telomeres are the shortest fuse. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I would say the exciting data is just the recognizing how important telomeres are to our health. There mm-hmm. are some products, natural products, on the market right now that <clears throat> uh, will. Let's say, uh, and I'm, I'm going to put it kind of in a weird way. They're, they're going to slow down the rate of your telomere shortening yeah. a little bit, but so will antioxidants and and um, uh, anything that anti- antioxidants. Like eating like, well, exercise, that kind of thing. Yeah, and and just healthy lifestyle. But the telomere shortening is, and lengthening is like a tug of war. You've got two teams working at the same time. You've got shorteners pulling. You got lengtheners lengthening. And uh, in almost all of our cells, there's no lengtheners. It's just one-sided. Mm. Uh, now you can, there's there's a basal level of shorteners you can have. Like I, I usually like to say, you can have two people pulling. You can't get less than two. Okay, and that's called the basal level of telomere shortening. Yeah. And for people who don't know, like you have this amazing um, diagram or visual in your talk. Telomere shortening equals aging. And telomere lengthening equals, I guess, reversing Reverse. aging, right? Mm-hmm. And you have this diagram where you show this kid, this baby that grows into a adolescent, that grows into a adult, that grows into a uh, older person, and you see the telomeres kind of shorten as the person gets older. I just want to set that frame for people yeah. who don't don't know I, that. I guess we haven't really, really explained telomere shortening and stuff like that, but yeah, talk about then. I guess. <laughs> Let me finish the tug of war. Yeah, thing. go ahead. Uh, you can add people, and that will increase the rate of shortening. And if you, you can decrease the rate of shortening by taking some of those people away, but you always have two left. Mm-hmm. I at, see. At the same time, you can also add lengtheners, but sometimes you don't add enough lengtheners to compensate for the shorteners, so it's still shortening. So you have two ways of decreasing the rate of shortening. One is to get rid of some of the shorteners. And one is to add lengthening, mm-hmm. and so <clears throat> some natural products exist right now to to actually add lengtheners, uh, but they're not strong enough to actually reverse our aging. Mm-hmm. Even though some of them are showing age reversal effects, mm-hmm. they're not showing. You know, I still look 63, and I don't look 25. And well, I always say when Betty White walks out on stage looking 25 again, then I'm going to say aging's been cured. <laughs> um. Yeah, so tell, tell people about telomere shortening disease then. Okay, well, we have telomeres are at the very tips of our chromosomes. Yeah. Um, and if you want, think of it like a shoelace. You've got a, a, a long shoelace, and the shoelace is like a string of beads now, and the sequence of the beads are what gives you your eye color and hair color so, because there's genes on this, on this string of beads. <clears throat> now, just like a shoelace has caps. Right and protect your shoelace. Chromosomes also have caps called telomeres, mm. and they protect our, shoe, our, our, our DNA. DNA. And uh, every cell in our body, we're, we have 100 trillion cells in our body. Every single cell in our body contains telomeres. Mm-hmm. In fact, they, every single cell in our body contains 46 telomeres, and actually 92 telomeres at some stages of the cell cycle. So, <clears throat> so we have a lot, a lot of telomeres. And they get short every time cells divide. And it used to be kind of thought that this shortening was uh, a result of aging. But when we discovered an enzyme called telomerase uh, back in the, or it was actually, we discovered it in 1993. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, we was, I guess, became recognized in 1997. We discovered it in 1993. 
And we found that uh, we could then put it into cells that lacked telomerase, and we found that we lengthened their telomeres, and the cells became younger by every method of measurement that's you can amazing. imagine. And uh, so, so that said that uh, telomere shortening wasn't a result of aging, it was a cause of aging. Uh, and so um, um, it's, uh, um, <clears throat> it, uh, it, it changed everything. And so, so it uh, made me very interested in trying to find ways of producing telomerase in all of our cells. The, ways, the way that we introduce telomerase, sorry if I pause there for a minute, but I just got a message showing up on the uh, bottom corner of my screen. I had to read it. Uh, but I, it's, it's not important. Okay, good. The, um, uh, I, I hope you can cut some of that out. No, I, I just go with it. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. The, um, um, so you're so, saying the, um, you know, what's interesting about that, when you discover it in 1993, I want to know, what was the lab like? I mean, I like, was it just someone at one in the morning who discovered it? Or was it, was it like someone just erupted and like I discovered it how what was the scene like when it was actually discovered well there's different different levels of discovery yeah because you discover it and you celebrate and then you have to prove it to everybody else and then you celebrate it again right okay? and so uh, what what happened is uh, I worked with uh, Bryant B. Aponto and Julian June Lee Fong and uh, Walter Funk and a few other people uh, and I was the leader of the team, I was the director of molecular biology, and we designed all these different approaches to try to get it. And so, you know, I don't want to give credit to one person or another because some people were assigned one thing, one some people were assigned right. another, another. But one of the approaches that was actually Jun Lin Fong and Brian Via Ponto were working on, uh, <clears throat> they ended up getting some uh, like bands on a gel that that corresponded, correlated with what could be a telomerase activity. Mm -hmm. They cut these things out and sequenced them, but the sequence, you know, didn't mean anything. I mean, we because we had no idea what the expected sequence was supposed to be. Yeah. But I took the sequences because I, 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 I had a, I'd written a lot of software for computer modeling of DNA and RNA and stuff. Yeah. And so I took these sequences and uh, uh, analyzed them and. There was something like 17 different sequences that they had isolated. And when I looked at sequence number three and looked at how the RNA folded up and, and it's what, where the key things, that, that sequences that would, could be potential key sequences were actually in bubbles and how it, hairpins were perfectly structured and stuff like that, I just said, this is it. Really? And you just saw it and knew it? Yeah, I said, we discovered telomerase. And that was three months and 17 days after I started working at Geron Corporation. Right. Well, and we'll get to that story of how you got there, but yes. But uh, uh, at that point, uh, nobody uh, believed me. And uh, not, not even Brian Villapontel and Julian Fong. Why not? Why didn't they believe you? Because, because they didn't understand the folding of RNA as well as I did. And, and how, I, you know, I, my minor in college was uh, statistics, uh, and I think that's something that's really underrepresented in schools. And to, to know the probability that a, a, an RNA could have a folding pattern like that, based on probability and statistics, made it say to me, that has to be it. There's no way something could fold like that uh, and uh, but be just by chance. It had to be yeah. real, and, and the fact that it put the what's called the telomere coding sequence TTAGGG, TTAGGG into this bubble, okay, on the RNA uh, was like also equally unlikely. And uh, so, uh, uh, what well, all we did was <clears throat> to prove it uh, is we went ahead and mutated that sequence I just mentioned, TTAGGG, TTAGGG. We mutated it so it made something like TTGGGG, TTGGGG. And uh, then we put that RNA back into cells, and then uh, ask what uh, what was the what telomeres? What were the sequence of the telomeres now? And the telomeres suddenly became T T G G G G. Oh wow! T -T -G, -G, G G G. And that's that proved it. And the uh, uh, the email that was sent out to everybody announcing that we had really proved it is actually 
hanging on my in my hallway outside my door. I can't remember the date, but it was uh, uh, a f maybe two or three months after uh, we had already convinced ourselves because we didn't do those mutations on any of the other ones. We just yeah. did it on one because we were certain we just wanted to prove beyond That's a shadow amazing. of a doubt to everybody else that we had discovered it. Yeah, and uh, now it's it's unambiguous. It's everybody is confirmed all over the world. Yeah, uh, then we discovered the protein component shortly thereafter because our telomerase is made up of an RNA component and a protein component. And uh, uh, so Bill, let me ask you this: with that, at the time you discover this. What in your mind are the repercussions or advancements that you see at the time? Because now we discovered this. What was next? What did you see was next after you discovered this? Well, I saw a cure for aging. Yeah. Uh, the uh, I, I my 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 goal my whole reason for going to Jerome Corporation was because I was convinced that telomerase lengthening telomeres was the cure for aging mm -hmm. and it reverse aging. Um, and I, you know. I, the, how I got to that point is a long story too. Yeah. But the uh, well, I'll um, ask a few questions that will, will lead us there for sure. I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't anticipate at the time that it would be a lot more than just a cure for aging. I figured it would reverse a lot of age-related diseases, mm -hmm. but I never ever predicted that it would reverse. I mean, it had the strong potential right now of re of reversing AIDS, uh, which is not typically an age-related disease. But right. It's now known that the AIDS virus. The way it makes people sick is by causing accelerated telomere shortening in mm. immune cells. And uh, so if we could keep the telomeres long in immune cells, AIDS patients would probably live normal lives. Now, in the United States, AIDS is well covered. Uh, there's lots of medications and stuff like that. But yeah. I look forward to the day when we can, you know, air airdrop, uh, what do you call that, uh, parachute down uh, right. uh, bags and bags full of this stuff for third world countries right. where AIDS is just out of control. So that's why you see people living with HIV for so long and then it hits AIDS because that's the telomere shortening and becoming so immunocompromised? They don't even know they have AIDS for two to ten years after they get infected because the AIDS virus doesn't do anything except right. cause the immune system to age faster. Right. And then when the immune system dies of old age, and that's why you have immune deficiencies because the immune system died of old age, then, then, you're, uh, then you can't protect yourself against anything. Mm. And so people die of everything, including carposis sarcoma. So why do some people say you can't call it a disease? Because we all have it. It's normal. Uh, it, it's it's just crazy. I, I you know I'm not a semantic expert. I don't know the definition of disease. I don't know <laughs> the definition of curing a disease. Right. I just know that you know I know I know we're going to get to this later. My father, when I was ten years old, he suggested to me that when I grow up, I should find the cure for aging and I never ever thought it would be anything different than a disease and something that you can be cured mm -hmm. I did I actually I never encountered anybody questioning the fact that I call it a cure or a disease until I actually became public about the research that I'm doing uh, back in uh, 2008 okay then I started being bombarded with people from like NIH and and uh, um, what are, what are the other ones? Uh, um, like and, the uh, CDC or something, I don't know. No, okay, but yeah, I, I, NSF and things like that. Uh, I can never remember their numbers, uh, names. But the, uh, uh, they start, I started being told, you can't call this a disease. Hmm. And you can't cure this. And I was told, we'll never allow you to do clinical studies to cure aging because it's not a disease. Well, <clears throat> I... I I mean, I've stumbled upon a few things that I argue makes it a disease, uh, but um, I'm not. I don't really care about the semantics. Right, you know, right. I, I always say when we do cure it, uh, everybody's going to call it a disease. <laughs> and, uh, so, so it's just we just have to focus on. Uh, it's a mindset shift. That's why I ask about it because people think it's normal and it's just it it's just well, inevitable. Well, I'm just amazed at how many yeah. people. When I talk to them, they're just like, "Oh my God!" I, they, they they never even thought of the concept, and it's like they're they're suddenly like unable to stand. They they, they lose control. They, it's like, oh "My God, this is like a seventh dimension thing you're talking about. Right. It's just real." And and you know, it's like I I've been thinking a cure for aging ever since I was ten years old. I love living. I you know I just want to live as long as I can. And and I, I you know this this I spoke at a conference I mentioned before. 
uh, people unlimited. And I'll tell you, people unlimited is something I want to talk about. Too go sometime. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. But, that, but first, I, I spoke at their conference, and uh, um, <clears throat> I uh, uh, let's see, what was I going to say? The uh, um, with people unlimited, and I asked yeah, uh, why you can't call it disease, and people kind of wavering, uh, yeah, like it's a seventh dimension thing. Yeah, there was something I was uh, something else I was going to say about that. Um, Oh shoot! Well, the people on unli- we can talk about people unlimited for a second. Me, and, I'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah. Pe- because I remember when I talked to Liz Parrish and I watched her talk at People Unlimited, and they just went. I'm like, you should bring those people wherever you go because they were just. People Unlimited is the most amazing group of people ever. In fact, here's here's what they they are. They're just a group of people that are convinced that they that science and stuff like that will find a way to cure aging and they're already planning on living forever okay or living as long as possible Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, so they're 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 practicing great lifestyles they're not a religious group they're not a political group they're I mean some of them in there are religious some of them are political but Mm -hmm. but you know when you attend any of their meetings it's just if 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 there are people out there they are like-minded like I am yeah. that I just love living and I want to live as long as I can, then those people, you all out there, you should join this People Unlimited group. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is amazing. I've spoken three times now to the group, and I'll tell you, I, I've never enjoyed speaking more because the audience is so enthusiastic. Amazing, yeah. yeah. And, uh, boy, I sure wish I could remember. What did you talk gonna... about this time around to People uh, Unlimited? Well, I, you know, it's, it's like I have so many things I can talk about, but I, I, I typically like to talk about just to you know, first define what telomere shortening is, and then uh, define um, uh, you know. I, I like to talk about how I got involved in aging, and how much I love living, and how. Oh yeah, I know what I was going to say. <laughs> okay, there's there's a term that I learned uh, from friends of mine. And I'll mention his name. A guy named John V Hill mm-hmm. in uh, Las Vegas. As V I G I L, he's a uh, uh, sports medicine doctor. Uh, he, he's really, really excellent. A lot of ultra marathon runners go to him, mm. uh, and a lot of like ultimate fighters and stuff like that go mm-hmm. to him. Uh, Frank Mir, uh, it, it's he's an incredible guy. But he 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 told me this term FOMO, F O M O, and it became really popular with me. And so I I made a slide at the People Unlimited said FOMO, and I said this means fear of missing out. Mm. And if I'm not afraid of aging, I'm not afraid of dying or anything like that. But I'm I'm afraid of missing out on on being here when we find life on other planets. You know, mm-hmm. when we find the origins of the universe and we find a cure for all these different things, and we find, you know, we, we find how to c- figure out what the structure of an atom is and how how its secrets are going to explain the whole universe to us. It's like. Right. Those and then the, all the alternate universes and the multiverse and stuff like that. I, I, I don't want to miss that, you know. <laughs> yeah. I want to. I, I, I don't want to miss out on that. So it's fear of missing out, and that's a great reason why I want to live as long as I can because I love living, and I, I don't want to miss out on all the great things that are going to happen on the future. Yeah. So Bill, you know, we were talking about telomere shortening and things that accelerate telomere shortening. You know, with oxidative stress, aging, cigarettes, bad diet, poor exercise, anything else that you found that surprised you that has accelerated, uh, that accelerates telomere shortening? Ooh, let's see. Because um, you just mentioned the ones I would I would say, but yeah. uh, uh, I mean, just a sedentary lifestyle yeah. accelerates aging. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, well, yeah, you mentioned stress. I mean, let me emphasize stress. There's two types of stress. There's oxidative stress and there's psychological stress, uh-huh. not the kind your boss gives you, and, and that causes. <laughs> <it's a little laughs> um, the uh, caregivers of Alzheimer's patients mm-hmm. have been tested in two different studies. In both cases, they were shown to have shorter telomeres than their friends their same age. Really? They were caring for somebody. The stress of the telomere telomere shortening. Mm-hmm. Also, mm-hmm. adults that were abused as children have shorter telomeres. And it also mm-hmm. weren't abused as children, mm-hmm. uh, all because of stress. Uh, household income, low household in- income, the 
the uh, neighborhood you live in, all these things have been shown to cause accelerated telomere shortening. Yeah. All that's stress related. Yeah. Uh, stress is a horrible, horrible thing. Um, and so you've got to decrease stress and, you know, there's a lot of things. That's you really might... interesting. Yeah. I'm curious <laughs> if, are there studies that show, like if you go to a psychologist, let's say they compare like abused children and ones who went to a psychologist and worked on it and didn't, if their telomeres were still shortened after doing therapy or is it is it pretty much locked in at that time? Once your telomeres get short, there's no way to lengthen them by lifestyle choices. Mm. There's only two methods ever discovered in human cells that lengthen telomeres and one is expression of the enzyme telomerase. Mm -hmm. So it produced the enzyme telomerase inside your cells. And the other one's called ALT, A-L-T. It stands for alternative lengthening of telomeres. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a method that involves a recombination of the telomeres. So they recombine and actually get longer as a result. Mm. ALT is only found in mutant cells, okay? Most specifically cancer cells. So it requires mutation. So that's mm. not the kind of thing we want to do. Yeah. You have to it's, alter the cells yeah. to do that. Yeah. But ALT doesn't stand for altered. ALT stands. Alt stands for alternative, yeah. but the uh, uh, but producing telomerase is really the only way that we can lengthen telomeres uh, and uh, uh, not cause any other mutations or side effects and still have normal cells. Yeah. Uh, so we so we could produce telomerase, lengthen our telomeres to the length of a 24 year old, and then if we shut the telomerase gene off, that cell would be absolutely 100% identical to a cell from a 24 year old. Mm. Uh, and uh, the telomeres will then start shortening at the normal rate. And so 26 laters, 26 years later, you'd be 50 again. Mm. And your cells would be at least, and, and that's what I'm trying to make it so that the whole body, the whole human would be aged like that too. So producing the telomerase will help essentially reverse aging, stop aging and reverse and it. You, what what is known not, to do that? What what can again? Um, that's the next question, right? That's the that's the question. Okay, uh, there's there are several products on the market. Yeah. Uh, that would do it. There's there, okay. There's two products on the market that would do it. Okay, uh, but uh, only one of them has clinical studies that actually prove it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so let me just mention that one. Yeah, that's the TA65. Yeah, TA65. Yeah. They have several clinical studies. It's a very respectable company. I mean, the, if anything, I'm, I'm a pharmaceutical scientist by trade, and I've, I've been f kind of forced to enter the, the natural product arena just as a way to obtain funding to fund my pharmaceutical research. Uh, and I mean, I've learned that there's a tremendous amount of, of misinformation, quackery, charlatan type stuff in the natural product field. Uh, I I do not associate myself with those companies. If you ever hear of me being associated with any company, it's it's a highly respected, very ethical company. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> but I, I don't want to mention names at, at this time, except I do want to say that, like we said, TA65 does have clinical right. studies, and it's run by very ethical people yeah. that are very passionate about curing aging. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's 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 a mild telomerase inducer and so is the other one. Neither one of them um, will be sufficient enough to turn us into 25 year olds again. Right. But, you know, in both cases, I've seen tremendous, uh, you know, I'm not a testimonial person, but with myself, I, right. I've seen tremendous improvement in my running. My endurance has gotten better. Yeah. Uh, I remember days. reading that you were their first customer. I was TA65's very first paying customer. Paying customer. There were three, three other people who worked at the company uh, that started the day before I did. Uh, and I tell you, this was exciting. This was exciting times because none of us knew at the time what the potency of it was. Mm -hmm. We, we mm -hmm. had, because Gerald Corporation, where I had used to work, they, they, they developed TA65 after I left. Uh, they didn't want to focus on this anymore. They wanted to go and focus on cancer and stem cells. Yeah. So uh, this company, TA Sciences, uh, they licensed it from Geron Corporation without any studies having been done. It was all, we, all they knew is that there was 
data showing that it actually produced telomeres, but we didn't know how much. Mm -hmm. uh, it quantitated. You'd wake up the next morning, like <laughs> 10 oh, years. Yeah. Right. No, no. The, the next morning, both me and the president of the company, Noel Patton, we were calling up each other every day saying, see any aging? Are we getting <laughs> you know, things like that. Uh, but at the same time, right. my company, Sierra Sciences, uh, did a lot of studies on TA Sciences, and we did it for free. We were just passionate about yeah. uh, finding out if TA Sciences actually was potent enough to do it. And, and yeah. we found that it wasn't, but we did see, uh, and, and it was published in clinical studies, we did see some age reversal type of things. And I didn't understand why when TA65 wasn't potent enough to actually cause our net telomeres, all of our telomeres to get longer. But we were able to show in collaboration with a company called LifeLength, mm -hmm. uh, L-I-F-E-L-E-N-G-T-H, that measures telomeres in a way different from anybody else. They actually look at the percent of telomeres that are critically short. Mm. And we were able to show, and it's published in a clinical study, that, that TA65 actually lengthen the shortest telomeres. Even though the average telomere length and the long telomeres still got shorter, the shortest ones got longer. And so that started entertaining a whole new mm -hmm. subject area. Maybe maybe its average telomere length has nothing to do with aging yeah. and it's the percent that telomeres are critically short that was causes us to age. Yeah. And the yeah. age reversal effects that we saw were explained by seeing the shortest telomeres get longer. Yeah. Uh, now 10, 12 people were in that study uh, and uh, uh, 10 out of 12 showed we were able to see that their shortest telomeres got longer. The only two that didn't were the two youngest people in the, in the study that didn't have enough short telomeres to measure to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I think that's pretty good, yeah. solid statistical positive data yeah. saying that uh, that works. And, and as a result, we saw immune function improving and a uh, few other things. And so, so I've been, you know, I've been um, TA65 ever since. Yeah. Um, I've been, what, I guess that's not eight years of wow. taking TA65. Yeah, I remember I was watching an interview with um, some health professionals. They made a really bold statement saying, talking about TA65, about it's the only something about research out there. And so I'm like, hmm, that's a pretty bold statement. So I went and did some research and, and saw, wow, like TA65 price-wise, like it's not cheap. You know, if if you are going to purchase, you can see that there's a ten dollar supplement of, of some kind, and then there's a six hundred dollar per bottle, which is about TA sixty five, and then I had them send me the research because I was really interested, and I was trying, and I have some background in biochemistry and other things, and I swear I could understand like twenty percent of what they were talking about because it was so it seemed so um, complicated. Uh, from my standpoint, so I can imagine there was just a lot of research that went into uh, some of those studies. Well, I can tell you that uh, the $10 product doesn't really work. Yeah. Okay? I don't even know what that is. But yeah. I, no, I'm just comparing prices. It wasn't like it wasn't comparable to it. It was just you look at supplements in general of this this bottle and size, and it's 10 to 15 dollars, and this is 600. So it makes you think. Okay, what's in this six hundred dollar bottle of, of stuff here? Well, I told you there's another product too, and I take that every day too. So I take them both, uh, and you know, it's I'm just speculating that they might work by different mechanisms of action, and mm -hmm. so maybe they're synergistic. But I got to tell you, TA sixty five is expensive, not because the company that sells it is greedy. Okay, it's it's actually purified from uh, something called a stragglus root, right. down to a single chemical to actually increase its potency. And that purification step is quite expensive. So when people wonder why do they have to pay so much for it, yeah. that's why. Right. You know, TA60, TA, the company TA Sciences is not a billion dollar, trillion dollar company because so many people are taking this thing and, and they're making tons of money. They're, they're actually spending a lot of money on continuing doing clinical studies and stuff like that yeah yeah no i figured there was there was a good reason because that's it's a large differential um so bill talk a little bit about you know it's interesting to hear what you do on a daily weekly basis so you'll take t take t and again you know, aside from testimonial 
but just you know, curious on what you take. So you take the TA65, and you said you take another one. What uh, what else do you take personally that uh, you like? Uh, well, let, let, uh, what I take, what I okay, the things that I take are um, a lot of Isogenics products. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm a, a big fan of that company. Uh, I take uh, uh, something called Product B. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also called Isogenesis, which I'm one of the discoverers of. Uh, mm -hmm. And and uh, that's how I've learned so much about the company and, and have, have tremendous respect for the company. Uh, I, I also take their shakes and I'm actually drinking their cleanse right yeah. now. If this bottle wasn't so overused, you would see that it says Isogenics on the mm. side. But I drink. So I, what's in that? Just wiped it off. Uh, this is, you know, I don't really know. I, I I can look at the bottle and tell you, but it's all natural products. I'm not a natural product expert, but one thing I've learned is that Isogenics is a natural product expert. A guy named John Anderson is the best in the world. Hmm. Uh, and uh, I mean, the guy is so obsessed with trying to go all over the world, finding the best, best natural products. And so he, he comes up with these things and I, I just take them on faith. But I, I, I think they work tremendously well. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, we talked about stress before. Uh, several of those products ex ex that John Anderson has developed for Isogenics called Ionic Supreme is the one of the world's best things for uh, reducing stress because it's got things called adaptogens in it and that's a new word to me I've never heard of adaptogens before I got involved with uh, natural products the uh, uh, they have something called e-shots okay e-shots I think are the greatest invention in the planet it's it's uh, it's like five-hour energy mm. except it's also got adaptogens in it and so when I take a five-hour energy I'm, I'm caffeine I, I'm sensitive to caffeine I'm when very take, sensitive to caffeine yeah I, I've tried it sometimes. I remember driving on the freeway one time and trying to try do it. And within about 15 minutes, I had to pull over in the shoulder because I started shaking so I'm much. the same way, same exact way. And, I'll get uh, all jittery. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I suddenly worried about my health and would I be able to control myself in a uh, dangerous situation. Now, <clears throat> so I was a little leery at first when eShots came out, but I gave it a shot because I was such a big fan of Isogenics. And it didn't do any of that stuff. And it has caffeine in it, but it also has all these adaptogens that reduce stress. And so, I, this is crazy, but I sometimes take it to go to sleep. Really? You know? That because seems weird, yeah. I'm really stressed out. I'll take a e shot and it, it helps me go to sleep. Hmm. But it also helps me get more alert. Like, like I, I've started this routine of every time, like 10 minutes before I get on a stage to talk to people, especially if there's a lot of Q&A, yeah. I'll take an e shot. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm just always amazed at myself at how well I respond to everything because it makes you alert, makes you calm, makes you more sociable. You know, it's it's I, I think it's the fan, you know, I can go on and on about Isogenics. Interesting. All their products. I, I just when I look over at my other desk behind the I, computer, here, it's just covered with Isogenics products and blenders and things like that, because I that's all I do. My, I'm, my meals are all Isogenics and stuff. So what else do you do, Bill, that would surprise people in your daily routine, whether it's food or, I mean, obviously we know we you know learn the exercise component. Well, I also take pharmaceuticals. And, and a lot of people in the natural product world are just totally against pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And I, I think they're, they're wrong. I, I think the reason why pharmaceuticals get a bad rap is because uh, they have to be prescribed and the doctors that prescribe them have to keep records of reports. And so every time somebody shows a side reaction to a, a pharmaceutical, the doctor has to report it. So that's why everybody knows about all these side effects of pharmaceuticals. Whereas natural products, people people get a side effect and the company will say, well, quit taking it. And that's all. No records, no documentation, right. nothing. And I, you know, I personally, I personally do a lot of research in pharmaceuticals and natural products here. And yeah. some of the most toxic natural products, some of the most toxic chemicals we use for our positive controls are for in our toxicity assays are natural products really? that people take every day. What would be an example? I'm not going to mention those. <laughs> I mean, uh, can you talk uh, about not the company, you. not the company, but like a, like a, I'm not saying like it's vitamin C or what, what natural product would we be talking about? I, I can't do that because oh. I'm, I'm going to confess that almost every company sells these things. Okay. And, uh, but, but you know what? It's, I think 
I think that's still okay because our body has an ability to deal with toxicity on its own. Uh, and, and, so, and so the real big problem isn't are some things toxic to you and some things not toxic to you. The really big problem is that there isn't a chemical on the planet that somebody's not sensitive to because we all have different immune systems in our what's called a multi-histocompatibility complex. We have these DNA sequences that right. are used to make our antibodies, the, the variable region of our antibodies. And they're different in different people. And so we, we have sensitivities to different things. So, so it's not pharmaceuticals are bad and natural products are good or vice versa. They're, mm -hmm. they're all good, okay? And uh, it's just some people can't take them. Yeah. But I do take pharmaceuticals and uh, I would say my, the pharmaceutical that I'm taking right now that I recommend the most is something called metformin. Okay, metformin was originally developed to help diabetics, but it was amazing that there's lots of, and I, here's, here's some, an important term I'm gonna use, scientifically peer-reviewed journals, scientifically peer-reviewed research. There's lots of scientifically peer-reviewed journal articles showing that the people that are taking metformin had a lower incidence of cancer, hmm. people that weren't taking it. And it's been showing lots of other health benefits too. And now it's being touted as maybe something that extends lifespan. I've been taking metformin now for, I think, eight years, wow. a gram, a gram a day. Uh, and uh, it's- uh, I, How did you discover that you should be taking it eight years ago? Just by keeping up on the public literature. Hmm. But scientifically peer-reviewed literature on, uh, and and I'm I don't follow just aging. I follow cancer and heart disease research too because right. that's what I was doing before I got into telomeres was yeah. heart disease research, cancer research, and inflammation research. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get, talk about that a little bit. Um, so I want to go back to when you were ten. What did your dad tell you? <laughs> but let me let me back up a bit. It was it was around Christmas time. And uh, my parents, neither one of my parents graduated from college. Uh, they, they're, they're smart people, but they, they, weren't, they weren't like me, okay? Uh, I, was, I was the weird kid in the family. And, but, you know, I had six or seven brothers and sisters at the time. I wow. can't remember how many I had at that time, but because uh, I had more later. But uh, I, uh, I asked for a telescope for Christmas, okay? And so my parents on Christmas Day, I opened up the package, and there was a little toy telescope. And I cried, okay? <laughs> they didn't understand why I was crying. I said, I want a real telescope. I want a big reflector telescope with a really nice polished mirror and a really nice optical scope that I can look in. And I want to look out in the universe and see all these things that everybody talks about. And they were, like, blown away by this. Well, to get me to quit crying, they put me in the car, and they drove me to some stores, and on Christmas Day, maybe it was the day after Christmas now, uh, and uh, we ended up finding somebody that was selling a used telescope in uh, uh, some newspaper article uh, mm -hmm. advertising. And so I we went and looked at it, and I said, this is it. And my parents were shocked that this is something a 10-year-old kid wants. How did you know and, that? Uh, I, 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 you know, I went to elementary school. I, there was, in, in the classrooms, there's pictures of Jupiter and Saturn on the walls. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, I, I just knew that you looked at those in telescopes and maybe sometime before, maybe I actually looked through a telescope at somebody and was absolutely in awe. Hmm. And, and you know, back at that time too, is like, I think this was before Star Trek, but uh, uh, I was very interested in being somebody that would go into outer space and explore the planets and things like that. Uh, and, uh, and my parents, and I used to joke about that with my parents too, not joke about it, but they thought I was joking. Um, and then, so they got me this telescope, and I took it out on the front lawn, and I'll tell you, I, I found the moons of Jupiter, hmm. I found the rings of Saturn, I found Venus, you know, all these things, all by myself, just by looking at every star until I found things. And every time I was running into the house to tell my parents, come out and look, come out and look, and uh, <clears throat> they were just astounded. And then my father walks out, because I'll never forget this, he, he walks out and he says, Bill, since you since you're so interested in science and medicine, when you grow up, you should become a doctor and find a cure for aging. Hmm. And he said, I don't know why nobody's done that yet. You know, and it was like, it made it sound like it was something that's gonna be really simple. And, you know, at that time I, I had no people, scientists, friends that, my, that were my age. And so I thought maybe that I was a rare bird. 
So I thought, okay, I'll make that a mission because I thought, oh, God, yeah, why is anybody doing that? That's a great thing to be doing. I, I love living. I don't ever want to die. I don't ever want to be as old as my grandparents were at the time. I'm now older than they are <laughs> were at the time. But um, I've been obsessed with it ever since. Yeah. And uh, all through high school and college, everybody knew of me as the guy who was going to try to cure aging. Uh, they and, just saw something in you that was different and interest that interest and that spark for science. Yeah, yeah. well, that's what my father did. And, and, yeah. and my father, I didn't know this at the time, but he had been somebody who had been saying that all his life. Really? Yeah, he, he, he's, he's the person that coined the phrase, as far as I'm concerned, cure aging, mm-hmm. you know, because that's what he said to me. And <clears throat> so I, I remember when, when I was in when I first got out of graduate school and started working in biotechnology, he was so excited about the fact that I was in biotech, but there was nothing at the time that I thought worthwhile to pursue in the anti-aging world. Right. But I told him that there was a conference coming up, and uh, uh, it was at the Grand Lebakan Hotel in Lake Tahoe in 1993, and it was a conference on aging. and so. I told my father I was going to go to that conference to find some some way to start a company to cure aging. Mm. Uh, I, I was convinced that grant funding and stuff like that was never going to work. The only way, if you want to cure aging, you were going to have to start a company and find investors. Yeah. So he said that he wanted to go to the conference too and make a documentary on curing aging. And as a result, <clears throat> he and I went together to this conference. Uh, he contacted ahead of time all the main speakers tell them they were doing he he I you know I didn't know them at the time but I ended up meeting him through my father because my father met him at the conference and and we all had this big dinner and so I instantly became right in the middle of all the biggest names in uh, anti-aging and, you know, like Tom Johnson big big name and uh, uh, Caleb Finch big big name in anti-aging they were all there um, uh, I'm going blank on some of the other names but they were you know, Mike Rose, that's where I met Mike Rose. Uh, in fact, Mike Rose and I, along with a, another doctor named, uh, uh, I can't remember his name either, last name was Sabor, or maybe his first name was Sabor, he was a, a foreigner. The three of us decided to start a company working on using Mike, Mike Rose's approach towards uh, the way he had extended lifespan in, in fruit flies. That, right. that company, we, we spent all night uh, Playing that company, we decided to call it uh, uh, Project Methuselah uh, <laughs> for the company. And uh, what was it going to do? Yeah, I'm trying to remember that other guy's name, but uh, uh, <clears throat> we were going to just select for longer living mice because the Sabor guy, uh, God, I wish I could remember his name. Uh, he had he had over like 30 years had bred mice and had bred longer living mice, mm. <clears throat> and so we thought, well, let's use uh, Mike Rose's accelerated protocol <clears throat> to do that with uh, Sabor's uh, mice and see if we can identify the genes that are involved in the aging process. And so I was really excited. I has been up all night. And the next morning, very, very next morning, I'm barely awake and I go back into the conference room because now the conference has started up again on its second day. And uh, <clears throat> I'm listening to a guy named Calvin Harley talk, Dr. Calvin Harley, and he talks about the things called telomeres. Now, of course, we all knew what telomeres were. Anybody who'd gone through college or even high school knew what the tips of chromosomes were. They were called telomeres. But he had said that they age, they get shorter as you age, and that they, in such a way that he could take blood from anybody in the audience, measure the length of the telomere, and tell, tell them how old they are, and more importantly, how long it'll be before they die of old age. Mm-hmm. Well, up until that time, I was really frustrated because none of the theories on aging made any sense. Uh, <clears throat> why do pe- if, if we age because of environmental problems, why do people who live on the North and South Poles age at different rates than people who live on the, or why do they age at the same rate? Right. Live on the equator. The environments are very different. And then why do cats and dogs age at different rates when they're in the same environment? And so all these things didn't make sense. I decided a long time ago, even back when I was still in college, maybe even high school, there has to be some kind of clock that ticks. and uh, But what is that clock? I did look at circadian rhythms as a possible clock. I even talked to NASA about uh, sending up uh, some animals 
to put them in a different circadian rhythm uh, than they are on Earth and see if it affects their aging process. I, I had already sent experiments up on space shuttles. Really? Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, uh, purification of erythropoietin uh, was one of the things that I was doing with their electrophoresis operations in space. So I, I had connections there, but I'd, con I'd convinced myself that with a lot of published data that circadian rhythms couldn't be the explanation. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, this guy's talking about telomeres. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, shoot, I just started a company to focus on breeding mice. What am I going to do? But, but when Calvin Harley got done, I went right up to that podium before he could even get off. And I said, has anybody figured out a way to lengthen? I, mean, I think he talked about the Nobel Prize winner's discovery of telomerase in an organism called tetrahymena. Mm -hmm. And I said, has anybody discovered telomerase in human cells to lengthen telomeres? And he says, no, we've been looking for years and we can't be able to find it, including the Nobel Prize winners. Nobody's been able to figure it out. And <clears throat> now I'd already been developed quite some fame from a lot of different biotech uh, 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 successes. Uh, in a lot of things you know, like tissue plasminogen activators. Is, You're working at like Codon and Burlex Biosciences. Sciences. But so, so Calvin knew who I was and I said, you know, he said he, he was frustrated with saying they can't, can't figure it out. And I said, let me come and work with you. I'll, f I'll figure out what it is. I'll discover telomerase in human cells in three months. I, I, I'm usually pretty good at predicting how long it would take for me to do something. How'd you know that? Uh, just from basics, because I know all the techniques that have to be used. I know how to do them. I know. I also know that <clears throat> I will work around the clock if I if I'm gonna not make a deadline. I'll work around the clock for weeks and do multitask. I can do ten different experiments at once and make them all work. So I knew I can fulfill any goal. It took me three months and seventeen days. So I was, I was seventeen. <laughs> it was kind of an. That's still pretty good. But uh, uh, I I. I, I went back to, uh, uh, I, you know, I said, let me come and work with you. I've been 13 in, in three months. And he says, okay. Two weeks later, I was working for him, but I was in this dilemma. I just started a company. I was actually president of this Methus Project Methuselah company. So I went and talked to my father. And I said, you got to help me out here. Uh, <clears throat> I've, I've just become president of, of Project Methuselah, and I want to go uh, do uh, uh, I don't want to go work at Geron as an employee. And he says, well, let me be president. And I said, that's exactly what I was hoping. Because my really? father, had, he had a successful career at starting lots of companies. He was a world famous television producer, game show television producer, mm -hmm. produced like the number one daytime television show for seven years. He what was, was the really, game shows and television shows? Uh, you don't say it was the main one. Uh, and then there was also Celebrity Sweepstakes, It Takes Two, mm -hmm. Liars mm -hmm. Club. I mean, Anybody can Google Ralph Andrews Productions and they yeah. can find mm -hmm. out. They'd be amazed. He made a few movies too. So he had a pretty successful career. Uh, but uh, And he started other companies. So I, I took him and introduced him to uh, the guy who named like Pablo Sabir, Sabir, something I want to say, something like that. But I took him and introduced him to my father, to the, Mike Rose and stuff. And I said, what would you think about my father being the president instead of me? And they both go, yeah. I was, my feelings were hurt. <laughs> Whoa, what's going on here? But, but in fact, it was, he, he was a much better choice because it didn't make sense for me to be president at the time. I had no business sense whatsoever. I was just a scientist. And uh, so he became president of that company. And they did end up raising $500,000. Mm. But, you know, it's, it's just unfortunate. This whole field of anti-aging has been destroyed by all the quacks and charlatans that have been discrediting this field for thousands of years. And it's really hard to make a difference in this field because you are... People don't know who to trust, right right essentially. Right. Yeah. When, when I first... So, so I went to Geron. Uh, so it didn't, it didn't make it. It, it failed after uh, about a year. Um, and uh, I went to work at Geron Corporation uh, two weeks later, discovered telomerase, went ahead and showed that when we... Uh, put it into normal cells, the cells stopped aging. In fact, actually showed every sign of having aging reversed. So I also put the antisense into cancer cells and showed that they, the cancer cells died. Uh, <clears throat> and so it was like Geron Corporation had just suddenly discovered the cure for aging and the cure for cancer at the same time. And the investors said, we can't do both. What's, 
what's going to give us a higher return on our investment quicker? And they decided on the cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after four years of working at Geron Corporation, I left with Geron's blessing to start Sierra Sciences mm -hmm. uh, and uh, focus on trying to find the cure for aging yeah. Yeah. Uh, through telomere biology. Yeah, yeah. so I yeah. want to talk about Sierra Sciences and what the early days look like, but I want you to talk about Geron for a second. What was some of the research and what should people be doing? Because they were doing heavy research and um, treatments for cancer, right? No, I, I'm I'm part inventor of three of the different things that are in clinical studies right now to, to cure cancer through telomerase inhibition. Yeah. I'm a big believer in the fact that inhibiting telomerase, or let's say preventing, making it so the telomeres don't get longer um, is a good way to get cancer cells to die of old age. The problem that is happening is that when the telomeres get really short, uh, high rates of mutation start occurring. Because remember, like I was talking about the caps on your shoelaces. Right. When the caps get down to practically nothing, the shoelace starts falling apart. The same thing happens to your chromosomes. Uh, you can actually see chromosome rearrangements where pieces of chromosomes are broken in two and rejoined to different chromosomes. You can see those in the microscope of every cancer patient, okay, of cells from every cancer patient, C uh, cancer cells from every cancer patient, but not the, the regular cells. And <clears throat> so what was happening is that when, and it's been published, like Dr. Rhonda Pinnell is uh, somebody that I highly recommend you interview. Hmm. Uh, he's a, a person who uh, was highly believed that uh, inducing telomerase would cause cancer. Uh, and uh, he now believes the opposite, I'm pretty sure. I mean, he's, he's been able to show him that if he, if he induces telomerase just in uh, uh, certain tissues that are high, high risk of becoming cancer, that will increase that risk, those cells of being cancer. But that's true for any type of cell. Any type of cell, when you produce telomerase, you're going to increase the chances of that cell surviving. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do whole body and increase, increase the telomere length in your immune cells, I think it's actually going to decrease the risk of getting cancer and improve your ability, body's ability to fight cancer. So, so um, <clears throat> Uh, and where was I going? So you were saying there are two things that you helped discover at Geron, basically, that helped with cancer. Yeah. Uh, well, the idea was inhibiting telomerase or, or uh, producing, there was, yeah, okay, well, there's three different ways to cure cancer with uh, telomerase that, that we were working on. One was just directly inhibiting it by um, um, uh, an antisense oligo. Okay, and so that's in clinical studies. It's called Imeldostat. Mm -hmm. I call it GRN163L because that's what we called it when I was still there. Um, <clears throat> then there's the um, uh, immune approach where you uh, induce your body through uh, treatment of dendrocytes uh, to recognize uh, telomerase components and that your immune system will then kill any telomerase positive cell. Uh, when, and most cancers, and, you know, if, if, if you get a cancer that's big enough to detect, it has solved its immortality problems, okay? Because cells, cells don't get, you can't, like, when you take a, if you take any cells from the body and you allow it to grow, it may be at the best it could get to be the size of a mole. Mm. And then the telomeres are too short to allow it to grow any longer. So for a cancer to get bigger than that, it has to solve the, the immortality problem. It has to solve the telomere shortening problem either by alt or by a mutation that induces telomerase. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that'll allow those cells to live longer. Uh, but if you, so, so, so those cells will produce telomerase. So the immune approach, you, you induce your immune system to recognize those type of cells and so you can kill the cells that way. And the third approach was to take a Uncle, uh, 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 not an uncle, a, a toxic virus, a virus that contains a gene that when expressed inside your cells will kill those cells. Mm -hmm. And th this has been done now numerous times, but Geron was first. Uh, and you, what you do is you take the promoter for telomerase. The promoter is like the on and off switch, the light switch inside your cells that turn the gene on and off. You take that promoter and you put it so it controls that toxic gene inside that virus mm. DNA, you then infect cells. Now, if you infect a telomerase negative cell, 
that toxic gene won't be expressed because mm. the regulatory mechanisms for expressing it are missing. Right. If you infect a cancer cell, the regulatory mechanisms are now all messed up so that they are now turning the gene on. It will turn on that toxic gene right. too and kill the cancer cell. I mean, all those approaches are really, really exciting. Um, and I, I still have high hopes for the uh, uh, virus approach and the uh, uh, immune approach. But the uh, antisense approach has not been working because what happens is the telomeres get, so you, you see the cancers disappear, but you know, in one in a billion cells, okay, well, let's say well, the tel it's killing the cells by making the telomeres get really, really short. Okay, well, then all of a sudden mutations start occurring at a high rate, and maybe one in a billion cells are going to mutate in such a way that they induce telomerase to be produced, or right. they induce the old pathway. And then so, even though you see all the cancer cells die, those few, that one in a billion, are surviving, they grow back. And uh, uh, then those are immune to the telomerase inhibitors or anything else. And, and that's the other thing is that <clears throat> by letting the telomeres get really short, you make cancer cells uh, uh, resistant to any kind of therapy that you could provide to kill cancer cells because mutation rates allow cancer cells to survive anything you hit them with. So, so, <clears throat> the, but so the, the trick is to figure out ways now to, to kill cancer cells and keep telomeres long. Okay, and uh, uh, that's so you know, Jaron's got the two approaches one is yeah. the immune approach and the virus approach, and we've come up with two approaches too. Bill, if someone has cancer now and they're listening to this, um, are these things in cl clinical trials, or what, what do you think um, is something that they should be looking into, or do doctors already know this and they're are they experimental at this point, or what? Well, I, I I don't know if TA Sciences is doing a clinical study on cancer. I do know that they were quite amazed in their first clinical study at the low incidence of cancer in uh, people that they were looking at that were taking TA65. But the question is, will... I mean, from Geron Corporation, yeah. Yeah. No, uh, Geron's not looking at that as far as I know, but the um, um, clinical studies are needed in that area. Yeah. Um, but I'm a big believer in the idea that, uh, not mention any products or anything like that, and let's say future products, that if, if we lengthen telomeres in all the cells of a body of a person that has cancer, that's going to boost their immune system's ability to fight the cancer. Mm -hmm. but I think anybody who has cancer is suffering from also immune senescence, where their immune system is weak, or the, or the cancers have evolved or developed ways to fight the immune system. And by making a stronger immune system, you increase your ability to do that. But the bottom line is, I doubt that if you already have a cancer that's big enough to detect, I doubt if, if inducing telomerase in all the cells of the body is going to have any beneficial effects on that cancer yeah. at all. Because they're already immortal. Right. There's no way to make something more something immortal more immortal. That doesn't yeah. that's, that make sense. Yeah. Uh, and so, so it's more of the heat-seeking missile viruses that turn on and kill the cell, essentially, is the I best. Think that's but I'm, I'm a big believer in the idea that people should, when they, if they get detected, if they find out they have cancer, they should take a telomerase inhibitor to, do, to get rid of that cancer as much as possible. Hmm. Then go, then take a, actually, no, let's, let's I'm just forgetting a step. <clears throat> I think that they should take a telomerase inducer first. Because the cancer is not going to be affected. The cancer is already more. Take a telomerase inducer to help boost your immune system. Mm -hmm. then, uh, uh, then, take, then stop taking the telomerase inducer and take the telomerase inhibitor. The only reason to stop taking the telomerase inducer is it's a waste of money to take it then. Because if you're producing telomerase inhibiting it, you're, you're not getting any beneficial effects. So stop taking the telomerase inducer just to save yourself some money. Take the telomerase inhibitor to specifically kill the telomerase positive cells. In fact, that's another reason to quit taking the telomerase inducer because you don't want to kill the other cells either. So you want to you want to uh, take the telomerase inhibitor to kill the telomerase positive cells that remain after you quit taking the telomerase inducer. And then after those cells all disappear, then go back on the telomerase inducer 
okay, without the telomerase inhibitor to, to help boost that immune system. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's the, the way to go and the way everybody should be doing it. But uh, I'm not an MD. I can't give medical advice. I, and I, I, there is no telomerase inducer right now that I would recommend for that. Uh, but I hope in the future we will have clinical studies done uh, and uh, we'll have stronger telomerase inducers uh, to uh, actually make it a, a much better fight. Yeah. So, Bill, how did you know it was time to leave Geron and start Sierra Sciences? Uh, the, you know, my, my mission was, my goal was to never start my own company. I never, ever wanted to do that. I just wanted to cure aging and retire, you know, um, and, and actually go off and cure something else, maybe off the, my own funding that I create by all the profits I made from curing, uh, aging. But the, uh, uh, I, I remember that I did an experiment, uh, where I, uh, uh, in collaboration with two scientists at University of Texas Southwestern, uh, where we had produced telomerase inside of human cells and uh, showed that they actually exceeded the Hayflick limit. Mm -hmm. uh, they, it, it was more, it wasn't quite the Hayflick limit, it was a, another limit that's more involved in cancer called the M1 and M2 phases. But we showed that they exceeded that, uh, which was which was saying that that we had stumbled on a cure for aging. And uh, <clears throat> so at the next meeting at Geron Corporation, at the next scientific uh, science meeting, I presented that data. And, uh, you know, people were applauding, you know, this is the first time in the history that ever, that's ever been done. And, uh, you know, I was surprised that one of the senior people at, at Geron said, I thought I told you to quit working on aging. Not the response you're looking for. No. Yeah. And I said, we have decided that we're not, the investors have decided that we're not going to work on aging anymore. We're going to focus on cancer and stem cells. Mm -hmm. Actually, not even stem cells at the time, uh, but uh, cancer. And so I was like, God, I just presented data, world-class data. That is the first time ever that aging could be cured. And, uh, and I got that kind of response. And I mean, the, 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 I want to defend the person that said that because the person was also very, very passionate yeah. about finding a cure for aging. The person, that person was just as upset about the fact that the company was curing it. But I realized that, that now it was a company thing. We, we were all employees and we had to do what the company said. Right. And so I walked across the hallway. My office was right across the hallway after the meeting was over. I got on the phone and I called a person that I'd been working with for 20 years at a previous other previous company. And I told him that I'm ready to leave Geron mm -hmm. uh, and I'm ready to start my own company. And could he help me find someplace else to work yeah. while I do that in some yeah. other way of bringing in some money while yeah. I do that. And sure enough, he, he got me involved in a company called uh, EOS, e -O -E -O -S, um, to develop a uh, DNA array, something I can do in my sleep a DNA array for, for looking at uh, 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 cells, you know, looking at like what genes are turned on and off in cells. And I spent three months doing that. And that three months gave me the time to actually put the business plan together and uh, start. It was originally called Yonder Technologies. Um, <clears throat> I was always fond of people who used to say that, that aging was the yonder years. Hmm. Okay. And uh, they, they made it sound nice, the yonder years, you know, so, so I called it, and I was always fascinated with that word yonder. So I called it yonder technologies. And then remember before I was telling you how quacks and charlatans have been discrediting this field that people didn't want to invest. Well, when I did find investors, and I, I did find it quite quickly. I mean, my, really? my investor of the year, my national inventor of the year award helped a lot there, but <clears throat> I found investors right away. Uh, and, uh, the first thing they said to me is that they don't want anybody to know that they invested really? in it for aging. And so they made me change the name. And uh, I think it's okay now to say that they were members of an organization called Sierra Angels. And so I said, well, let's call the company Sierra Sciences. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so that's what we did. And we created yeah. Sierra Sciences. Yeah. And it took until 2008 uh, when the global financial crisis of 2008 hit that 
my investors finally said, okay, let's start telling the world what we've been doing. Yeah. And at that time, you know, we'd already made major discoveries that we never told anybody about. Now we're telling it all. And uh, sure, I got hit with the quack and Charlotte and stuff at first. Uh, my whole slogan, cure aging or die trying, came from when I was talking to an investor group, uh, somebody in the back of the audience that really thought this was all quack and Charlotte and stuff. It was just there to be entertained. He said, so you really think you're going to cure aging? And I just said, without thinking, or die trying. You know, I was so obsessed with it. I said, right. I'm going to do it or die trying. And everybody started laughing, and I didn't even realize what was so funny. <laughs> uh, but it was it became a joke and, and after maybe another year or two we we made that our model as secure aging or die trying yeah um, but uh, uh, it was it was really tough at first in 2008 uh, I went and spoke to audiences heavily advertised there'd be three or four people in the audience uh, <clears throat> but the good news is people started who went to those audiences started recognizing that you know, this guy's not a quacker, Charlotte, and this guy knows his stuff, and he's, right. he's making really good points and stuff, and he's not trying to sell us anything that's, that, that doesn't work. He's, tell, he's trying to tell us that he's trying to develop something that really will work, and so I wasn't trying to sell anything. And so my audiences grew and grew, and now, now I find speakers all over the world quoting my phrases. You know, it's like, uh, I, I think I've coined a lot of the... What are some of your favorite phrases? Uh... God, what is it? Uh, uh, you know, I, I love living. I want to live forever. Um, there's no evolutionary advantage to living longer than it takes to raise your young. Um, the uh, uh, telomerase does not cause cancer. Lack of telomerase causes cancer. Um, <clears throat> all these phrases I've coined. Uh, and, I, you know, I want everybody to use them. I, my goal is to not become well known for the person that cured aging. I, I want to see aging get cured so I can take the treatment. Right. You know, I, I would love to get back into the lab yeah. and not have to work at the lab bench, you know, get back and work at the lab bench and not have to be doing presentations. And even though I'm having fun doing this interview, I would rather be in the lab doing research like yeah. I used to. Because yeah. I, I told you, I can do 10 experiments at once and make them all work. Yeah. Really, really good at the lab bench. It's a waste of my time to be doing this i've got to you know we've got to find ways to bring funding to right that's uh, the toughest I, part is that the toughest part about ever, is raising fund, funding since 2008 yeah. funding is the obstacle and it was before then too and i just was fortunate to be able to find really good investors yeah uh, and uh, that were more interested in a cure for their aging than uh, uh, their um than how much money they're going to make and uh, you know let me just mention their names if yeah I'm sure it's okay with them. Um, I mean, it's on Wikipedia. I have it written right in front of me. Okay, Dan Feilstra was the actual first person uh, in Incline Village of, of Lake Tahoe. Uh, then there was Richard Offerdahl and uh, several others, but were short term, more short term. But then Pierre Luigi Zappacosta, uh, he's he was the president. He founded Logitech. Yes, right. And uh, uh, these people were just absolutely great investors. They they. They didn't stand in the way hardly at all. Uh, I said hardly, but they 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 were about as best as good at investors as you could possibly get to allow me to get the research done and never lose faith. You know, they always believed that we were going to succeed, and as we had our ups and downs, and they they I met with them every week, and they attended our scientific uh, strategy meetings, and they. They got to learn that you know the downs weren't because of bad science. It was because of learning about how human cells work, and we we learned things that may told us that it was going to be harder to do than we thought. Mm. Um, but uh, uh, you know, but you know, it's too bad because the global financial crisis of 2008 made it impossible for anybody to invest anymore. Yeah, and that's why I resorted to. Uh, finding other ways of finding funding and and it's like when you know when when you're broke what do you do you go to a pawn shop and sell something okay and so i decided what do we have that we can sell and we had a lot of things we could sell we had a we had a high throughput screening assay for detecting anything that would produce telomerase that nobody else had in the world. Mm -hmm. And we knew that nobody else would ever develop it either because it took us like seven years of brute force to even develop a positive control 
to allow us to optimize that assay. Yeah. And we keep that positive control at trade secret still. Yeah. Uh, but How much uh, funding did it take to get to that point? $33 million. Wow. So Richard Pier Richard offered up here, Luigi Zappacosta, uh, uh, Dan Filstra, uh, mostly Richard and Pierre Luigi. They put in millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, to do this. And they're still, in my book, going to be the very first people that benefit from whatever we come up with. And, yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're going to, I'm sure, always be a part of this company. Uh, but the... Uh, um, <clears throat> The, we'd, we'd made all these discoveries during their tenure. And, uh, uh, you know, one, one was the assay, so now all suddenly we could start testing natural products with our assay. Mm. Now, I was, I was always a pharmaceutical scientist. I always believed that nothing is real unless it was approved by the FDA. And I kind of still believe that, though I, I guess I'm leaning the other direction now because I, I have been very impressed with John Anderson and isogenics and their natural products. But the, um, we started, I, I called it marching into hell for a heavenly call. <laughs> and, and I still refer to it that way. It's like going into a field that I didn't really fit in with, I really didn't believe in. Uh, and uh, at the time, I, I believe in it a lot better now. Uh, but uh, I was going to do this just because we had to find some other source yeah. of funding. I don't know, yeah. Bill, I see it a little different because it's not like you're supporting a field, you're almost proving or disproving a field, right? Because people are bringing in their products and you are saying if they work or not, essentially. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, we never advertise. A lot of people uh, ask us to test their products and we tell them it didn't work. And but it's up to them to tell the rest of the world that. Right. We don't We don't get into that. It's, right. It's, uh, as I said, there's only two products that will work. Yeah. And, uh, um, and I've only mentioned one of them. Um, the uh, uh, and I'll mention the other one when they have clinical studies that actually prove it. Right. Uh, the um, uh, so that was bringing you funding. You were talking about how you had to decide how to fund the company since it's it's tough to yeah. get well, investors. Still the, we haven't really gotten to back to where we were when Richard and Pierre Luigi mm -hmm. were able to fund uh, the company, um, but the uh, uh, we're close. Uh, we also you know, we, we had discovered uh, several pharmaceutical products that weren't what we were actually looking for. They were intermediates. Hmm. Uh, hmm. If, if there was a scale from zero to 100, where 100 was a uh, pharmaceutical product that induced telomerase to a level that was high enough to stop telomer shortening, then higher than 100 would reverse, actually lengthen telomeres. Hmm. We had found something that was a score of 16 okay now 16 isn't what we're after but sure it should slow the i mean in, in vitro it definitely slows the uh rate of uh aging down yeah it show, slows the rate of telomere shortening down uh and uh so we thought well let's sell this so we licensed that to a company in new zealand back in 2009 or 2010 and uh they're now they're, they're now selling that. What the condition was that they can't sell it unless they do clinical studies, prove it's safe, prove it's efficacious, it right. actually works. And uh, so they, they actually did additional medicinal chemistry on it uh, to improve its safety. Uh, it didn't improve its uh, efficiency, but it improved its safety to where there was no toxic side effects whatsoever detected. And then they put it into a skin cream, uh, and uh, then they they sent it to a lab in Italy called Abich A B I C H, who performed clinical studies uh, for a long period of time uh, on a hundred women, and uh, it came back with results that were spectacular. Hmm. I mean, no no toxic side effects whatsoever. Not a single person showed any signs of any reactions or immune reactions or. Uh, there, the cancer test came back negative. It didn't cause increased risks of cancer. But the, effic the uh, efficacy was really remarkable, too, because it exceeded my expectations in that it actually did show signs of age reversal. Hmm. And, uh, again, we had to resort to this. Maybe it's lengthening the shortest telomeres, and that's the explanation here. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it, it's not turning people into 25 year olds again. Yeah. But it is, it is causing wrinkles to disappear. It's causing firmness and elasticity to come back in skin. And I don't want to get into promoting this. Uh, I mean, I guess since they've done clinical studies, I can I can mention their name. It's a uh, uh, it's a product called uh, One Truth Eight One Eight. It's marketed through in Italy, uh, not in in New Zealand, uh, in Australia, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, hopefully soon in the United States and other places. Yeah. Uh, but it's uh, uh, the website for it is www. Tam818.com and Tam is T is in Tom, A is in Apple, M is in Mary. Mm-hmm. It's the, the TAM stands for telomerase activating molecule, mm-hmm. and 818 stands for the fact that the drug that they modified uh, to make it safe was our 314,818th chemical that we tested. Wow. So C0314818. Wow. They didn't call it that so they changed it to tam <laughs> that'd be a long name <laughs> and uh but it's yeah. working really but but the whole point of bringing this up is that they they've just launched recently and i think this is going to take off and i believe this is where we're going to get our fund all our funding from because yeah. we get royalties off the product even though they modified our original chemical to make it better our agreement was that we we still uh get royalties off of anything that they, they developed us even better uh, so they they had a scientific team and stuff like that, and they had medicinal chemists that that uh, modified it further. Uh, and so so this is now just being launched. Um, we are getting uh, small amounts of money so far from royalties, but I think it's just going to skyrocket. And I, I'm now predicting. I, mean, I was predicting that we'd have all the funding we need by June of this year, but that was last month, and we didn't get it. But I'm I'm not. You're always a- 17 days off, so you still have some time, right? Well, I, in the science level, I'm 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 never ever going to profess myself as being a business person, uh, and uh, so my predictions were way off there. Now I'm saying the end of this year we'll have all the money we need, but uh, you know even when I first started uh, Yonder Technologies, I, the very practically first line in the business plan is said I do not want to be president. I am not a business person. I want to be the chief scientific officer right. or vice president of research. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and I'm trying desperately not to become a business person. I'm trying to remain a scientist so that I can jump back into the science field and then plead mm-hmm. ignorance whenever anybody asks me for business advice. So, um, Bill, what will it take funding-wise to get you back in the lab? Uh, <clears throat> if we were to get $15 million right this minute, uh, I would go in the lab right this minute because that's, that's how much money we need for the first year of the follow-up research, okay, to, to uh, make make a drug uh, that is equal to a score of 100 on that scale that I mm-hmm. talked to, or even higher. We think from extrapolating from how long it took us to go from like a score of 1 to 2 to 7 to 10 to 16, 16 right. we extrapolate, it's yeah. less than a year before it would be at 100. Yeah. So we figure that $15 million uh, to buy all the equipment, hire the people and stuff like that for the first year. Now we we would take another two years before we'd actually begin doing testing on humans because there'd be a lot of animal testing, a lot of characterization that we do. So we, we think we need about $40 million to get through the first three years. Uh, and then we can start putting this into clinical studies, to start testing this in clinical studies. And people can start taking advantage of this by volunteering to be subjects in the clinical studies. Uh, but uh, I think the product sales from especially the One Truth 818 uh, will will uh, provide us all the funding we need by the end of this year. But because of the fact that I do have like family members that are suffering terribly, like from Alzheimer's, especially my father, the person that got me into this whole field from begin with. And if anybody watched The Immortalist, they'll get a chance to see him. Uh, he's he was early stage of Alzheimer's. In fact, some of those scenes was before we knew he had Alzheimer's. Mm. He, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's during the filming. Uh, and then the filming took four years. And then so we, we could see some progression. And now he's pretty bad. And I'm a mm. big believer based on studies from Dr. Rhonda Pinnell that I talked about before mm-hmm. on mice um, showing that uh, uh, you can actually restore brain function by lengthening telomeres. Mm. And so mm. I'm so I'm very eager to 
accept a $15 million investment just so we can get started on the research today, yeah. not have to wait to the end of this year. And because of my inability to predict well in the business world, it might be a year from now, not six, five months from now. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that's so $15 million would, would do it. I would hang up my coat, put my lab coat on and just drop out of sight until, yeah. until I walked out behind Betty White when she looks 25. That's got to be the frustrating part about it is it seems like you know the path and it's just the funding to get to that path. Frustrations, frustrations, exactly, if not an underestimate of the word. Yeah. It's so frustrating because I know and my scientists know exactly what to do and the obstacle is the funding. My scientists are sitting here waiting for something to happen to mm. get funding so they can get back on this thing. Uh, yeah. Me or them, none of us. We don't. We don't want to go find some other yeah. job. Who's best to do who's that? Like, who's the best? Like you said, you want to be the chief scientific officer. Who's best to run it from a business perspective out there? If you could pick anyone, um, <clears throat> Lee Iacocca. Hmm. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't know who the best business person like is. Like Elon uh, Musk. I can see like Elon Musk. Uh, he's already started uh, the, the Tesla stuff here. Yeah. And uh, so I'm in Reno, Nevada, where t he's setting up a major factory in, in Reno. Get him to come through might, the lab. Maybe he just might do that. That would be, be great. But, you know, it's got to be somebody who's passionate about curing aging. Yeah. And what I've done is I've created uh, like several. I've, I've got Sierra Sciences and I've created a few subsidiaries of Sierra mm -hmm. Sciences. Sierra Sciences is going to remain a research company. I am going to try to stay, maintain control of that company so that nobody can. Nobody's directing my research, but we've created a sub company that's, that's, that's for marketing. So when we have a product to market, then, then that company will be the company that markets it. And they can have 80% of that company for all I care, an investor or anything like that. Yeah. But <clears throat> that's where we need a president. We don't need a president for, for running the research. Okay, so I would become the chief scientific officer in a company that has no president. Yeah. Okay. And then what we need is somebody to be running the marketing company uh, and investing in that. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's something new that we've set up because now that should attract the people that aren't just passionate about aging, but also the people that are passionate about making a lot of money. Um, and, you know, I'll end up making a lot of money, but I'm sure I'm going to spend it all on, <laughs> on things. In fact, you know, we're, we're not making very much money right now, but we're spending thousands and thousands of dollars to help other companies, you know, like the Sens, you know, Aubrey de Grey's company Sens. Yeah. Uh, we 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 were a, a gold sponsor. We spent we funded we gave them twenty five thousand dollars to help promote their conference, and we're doing the same with the next yeah. one coming up uh, in about uh, three weeks from now. Uh, and uh, it's like so when I get a lot of money, <laughs> you just funnel it into other things I'm, with the same cause. I want to make life happier, and it, money doesn't money doesn't do it all by itself. You know, yeah. you got to, and I always like the idea that, you know, maybe it's going to, maybe I'll be 90 years old when I make a lot of money, but, but at that time I'll, I have probably 200 more years to enjoy it all. Where do you think we're at with that? If you predict, um, like the average lifespan or getting people to live to 130 or 140, 150, how, how far it, off do you think let's that talk is? talk about 130 first. Yeah. yeah. Um, I believe that we can get to 130 and be healthy simply by lengthening telomeres. Mm -hmm. or keep, yeah, keep, keeping them long or lengthening them. And if we got the, that $15 million funding today, as I said before, I think we'd have a drug ready for, ready for testing in humans, or at least in animals, in less than a year mm -hmm. that will be potent enough to actually lengthen telomeres and make, like we're gonna probably do our studies on cats. As I mentioned before, uh, people who have AIDS the only thing that's really happening is that viruses cause an accelerated telomere shortening of their immune cells. Well, cats also suffer from AIDS. They have a virus called FIV, or feline immune deficiency virus. And I'd like to do my preclinical on that to show that the cats can live normal lives yeah. uh, if, we, if we treat them with a telomerase-inducing drug. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, so we have all these things, but I think that we'll be ready for testing in those cats in less than a year but after we get our funding. I think I said this three years ago too, but we never got the funding. Uh, and uh, uh, then we have something ready for human clinical studies within three years. And then in combination, you know, you'd already interviewed Liz Parrish.
but her company, uh, I think that's going to turn into some stuff mm -hmm. that might even be quicker based on using gene therapy approaches. Because, you know, gene therapy in the past has been kind of a dangerous thing to do. The, the technique itself puts you at risk of increasing your cancer risk. I think there was a bubble boy study, clinical study done on something like seven uh, boys that were suffering from the bubble boy disease. Mm -hmm. and I think it's like five of them ended up getting cancer just from the therapy wow. uh, and dying. And so, so gene therapy has some hurdles to go through, but I think there's a new virus out that is actually solving these hurdles, and that's called adeno-associated virus. Uh, and there's actually some like close to 200 clinical studies underway right now using that virus to treat various diseases. Just none of them are doing uh, telomerase, but... Uh, so it's less likely to cause mutation, is that why? Yeah, it, because of the fact that it does not integrate itself into the chromosome. Mm. Whereas all other viruses integrate themselves into the chromosome as part of the life cycle, and the integration event can cause cancer. I mean, if you integrate, if you integrate the virus into a gene Changing. that actually protects you against cancer, well, you suddenly lost that protection because yeah. that gene got destroyed, yeah. um, and and or at least decreases your chances of that work because you do have two copies of every gene. Um, but the uh, but so I think I think. Liz Parrish might come up with something even sooner. Unfortunately, the, the cost of what Liz Parrish is going to do is, is going to make it so it's probably not affordable, almost certainly not affordable to everybody. Uh, and so that's why I like the idea of a pill. Yeah. And, you know, one of the reasons why pharmaceutical drugs are so expensive isn't because the, the drug is expensive. Yeah. It's the research is crazy. No, no. It's because of all the marketing, the advertising, oh. the, the getting doctors getting doctors their share of the profits and, and things like that. It's, that's where all the money comes in. And so I believe that when, as I said before, when Betty White walks out on stage and looks 25, there's not going to be any need for any marketing, you know? And so I, I'm, I want I see. whatever mm -hmm. I develop to be something that everybody can take and very, very cheaply. Yeah. I don't want to hear anybody can't afford to take what, what I want to develop. Yeah. And that's was Liz's sentiment too, which is yes, right now it's expensive or whatever. She said it was like a hundred thousand per shot or whatever it was. And I think it's closer it, to one more digit. Well, I mean, if you need multiple ones, obviously it will be like a million dollars or you know, it will come out to it, that. It's yeah. gonna be like one shot will cost a million dollars. Oh really? Holy yeah. cow. Yeah. But she was in the sentiments of yeah, she would want she wants it to be free for everyone essentially, you know, and and a plan to the whoever the government to roll it out and so she she's very passionate about children she wants to see all children yeah. be healthy yeah. so that's her focus and she wants to she wants to see herself and just like I want to see myself get benefit she, she her yeah. focus is to make a lot of money yeah. she's, she wants to make, see a better world yeah but uh, yeah well, what else has been the toughest part bill that you see besides funding for serious sciences and getting to the next level the skepticism uh, and the, you know, the, that that's decreased tremendously in the last like uh, five years more. You know, um, and I, I think that has a lot to do with me getting out and doing speaking tours. And, yeah. and rarely, I mean, a few t cases I charged for it because it was the purpose of the meeting was something I wasn't interested in. But but right. I I do all my talks for free at just traveling expenses, just because I'm trying to educate the world. I've got a book out called Curing Aging. Mm -hmm. All the profits from that go right to the research, um, and the movies that are out right now, like The Immortalist and mm -hmm. The High, I think are going to help promote this research. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the and and I think through all that, people have been looking at me and saying, "This isn't that I'm not an example of a skept, a quack or charlatan." Right. It sound yeah. like I'm really serious about doing this, and uh, so I think that's decreased skepticism a lot. Uh, and then the other thing is that a lot of people uh, used to believe that telomerase would cause cancer. And this is, remember I mentioned that back in the early days, in the early 1990s, when I led the research, I don't want to say I did it all by myself, because Brian B. Pontal, Walter Funk, and Julian Fong played a tremendously big role in, in discovering telomerase. Um, <clears throat> but the, we, we, we put the antisense into cells and showed that it killed, by inhibiting telomerase, it killed cancer cells. Hmm. A lot of people started saying, well, if inhibiting telomerase kills cancer cells, then telomerase must be the cause of the cancer. And 
you know, that's been misguided. I haven't done a lot of effort, but put a lot of effort into trying to prove them wrong until lately. I've just been doing this, and it's, I've been very effective at doing this. Now, almost every audience I speak of to when I get done explaining it, I you know, explain that it's short telomeres that cause cancer. Uh, it's, the, it's the rearrangements of the chromosomes, all the mutations that you get. Lengthening telomeres, keeping them long, doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, cause cancer. And cancer cells that are at least detectable cancer cells are already immortal, and so telomeres isn't going to do that. And I go through a long, spend about 10 minutes just talking about all these things, and I, I'm just amazed at how many scientists come up to me, like after, at, even at the People Unlimited, there were scientists in the audience that actually were big believers that telomeres would cause cancer, hmm. and they came up to me afterwards and said, holy, man, this is... Where did, why does everybody think telomeres is going to cause cancer? That's really, you know, I give a really good logical argument as to why it's only going to decrease the risk of cancer and increase our body's ability to fight it. But that's been a big obstacle, is mm. belief that telomeres is going to cause cancer. And now there's hundreds and hundreds, since, especially in the last five years, hundreds and hundreds of papers that have been published showing that short telomeres and lack of telomeres causes cancer. And not a single paper that says that telomeres long tail yeah. uh, Bill, so who, who would you say are, who are your mentors? My mentors, uh, I'm going to go, <laughs> you know, nobody ever asked me that question, but I, there are, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say Scott McLeod. I, I'm, he was the headmaster at my high school. Mm. Okay. He was somebody, uh, 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 Sanderson Smith. He was the math teacher at my high school that really made me into who I am. Um, these people played big, big roles and it, it wasn't scientists that met, mentored me because I, I'm, I'm not a big believer in the fact that everybody knows how to do science, but it was people knowing, teaching me how to logically evaluate things, do statistics, and then, and then <clears throat> um, um, another very important person that I'm just going blank on his name here, but a guy with, uh, um, oh shoot, um, uh, what is that? It, it's a actually a, a company that specializes, and I'm, I'm gonna, I'm just amazed I can't remember the name of it. Uh, I remember his first name is Bill, just like mine. But I'm going blank on his last name, but it's uh, companies that help you become better public speakers mm. and help you run a business and how to do well, be successful. Uh, Who's the company that, that says, um, win people over to your way of thinking? Um, I don't know. I'll look it up, though. I want to say uh, Murray or something like that. But, uh, uh, but yeah, th that person just played a tremendously great role. And, and, you know, if I ever win a Nobel Prize or anything, those are the people that I'm going to mention. I'm going to make certain I have their names written down so I don't forget them. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm really sorry I can't remember. No, I mean, there's... The Dale Carnegie Institute comes up when I put that in, but nothing. Dale, Dale Carnegie, that's it. Okay. Dale Carnegie and uh, yeah, it's, it's Bill Kofed of Dale Carnegie. Okay. Uh, I I took classes with him um, back in uh, I want to say the early late '80s and early '90s, uh, and uh, the guy just had answers to every question about managing scientists and mm -hmm. managing people and yeah. Being able to get in front of audiences and speak, and I mean, to this day, I I follow the lessons I learned from him. Mm. It's not so much memorizing his lessons; it was it was more learning the concepts and saying, "Hey, that makes sense." And then once once you learn a concept and you say, "Well, that makes sense," you you never forget it. It's not like you have to remember a concept. Right. I mean, it's it's uh, and so he he presented things in such a great way, and I, I, I'm gonna. You know, Dale Carnegie won't like this, but I did take some classes with some other instructors, and they were no, nowhere near as good as Bill Kofed was. And uh, it was something so, about him. Something about him just made made me into a better person, and I will be forever in his debt. Uh, and the same goes for Scott McCloud and, and Sand Sanderson Smith. So, what do you remember back from what you learned from Dale Carnegie and Bill Kofed? What did uh, because it sounded like you took it because you wanted to. For leadership purposes, because you're heading teams of scientists. Yes. <clears throat> um, the, how to manage people? How to, how to uh, you know, take into account? One thing I, I 
maybe he never said, but I learned from listening to him, is that you're never king, okay? You always report to your employees, mm. okay? Even like right now, I own 100% of my company. Uh, and uh, But I still feel like I better do everything my employees want because I don't want to lose them, okay? They're very talented people and mm. they're the best there is. And I would be devastated if, if I lost any of them. And uh, so I make certain that I... I serve them to the best of my ability. You know, it's it's uh, it, it's like look, teaching people how to reward. I mean, it's not so important to always say thank you as much as it is important to say good job. Okay, it's because sometimes thank you is an insult because if somebody does some really great work because they're very passionate about it and you say thank you for doing it, then it comes across as they did it for you. Right. And so you don't say thank you all the time. Yeah. Sometimes you say thank you. Thank you is very important yeah. to say. But sometimes yeah. it's best when you see, when you detect that here, here's a person that did it really because they're just passionate about what they're doing. You say good job. Yeah, you know? it's an appreciation. Yeah, and it's just there. There's there's memory techniques that I learned, <laughs> like one run, two zoo, three tree, four door, five hive. It, it's it's something that Dale Carnegie taught me. But it's it's so now when I need to memorize a bunch of stuff and I'm preparing for a talk, let's say presentation, and there's it's a new talk I've never given before, I don't like to go to a slide and say, oh, let's see what the next slide is. You know, I like to know ahead of time. So mm. it's the memory tricks that, that Bill Kofed taught me. Um, but he also taught me how to get up in front of an audience and speak and, and to focus on, make certain the audience is a better audience after they, you leave than they were before. Always make certain that they learn something, that you teach them something, okay, that's good for them. You don't get up and just talk about how great you are, you know. You, you, you tell them something that makes them a better person, and that's right. that's a really key thing. And there's, I mean, there's so many different things, and uh, I still have my manuals from oh, really? that's like 30 years ago now. Wow, yeah. It's, because uh, I'm sure that Dale Carnegie's passed away, of course. Right. I'm sure his teachings aren't going to change. What about but, scientific and the scientific realm? Uh, I don't know if you call it mentors, but there were three people that um, ended up winning the Nobel Prize that yeah. influenced. Tell me yeah, about that. They they had no influence on me. The, the um, uh, I you know I got into the field because they had been unsuccessful at discovering human telomerase, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, you know. You know, the fact of the matter is, Geron Corporation didn't even tell them that they had hired me, even though they were hired consultants to try to clone, to discover human telomeres. They hired, Geron hired me and uh, uh, never told them. And so they were pretty upset, actually, mm. when, when they learned that I had discovered telomeres, and, uh, or me and my team. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, they shouldn't feel that way because they, They've done a tremendous amount. They're, they're, they they put a lot of effort into showing how important it was to discover telomeres. And if you if you leave, go to the Nobel Prize where they won the Nobel Prize and see what they won it for, it wasn't for discovering telomeres. It was for discovering how important telomeres is. Mm -hmm. Even before it was discovered, they had already shown that it was an important thing to keep telomeres long. Uh, they had speculated that it was one of the things that made cancer cells become immortal. Uh, and it was one of the things, and they speculated that, actually, I don't know if they expect, I don't, I don't ever remember hearing that they speculated that, that this could be a cure for aging. But I know that Calvin Harley did, and he wrote a great paper called The uh, Telomere Hypothesis of Aging. And I think that was what opened the door. And, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, it was after we discovered telomerase, you know, I'm, I've made a plot before. If you search PubMed, you know, the database of scientific sure. peer reviewed journal articles, look at the number of papers on telomeres and telomerase. They, they, they average like one or zero from the, there was one paper in 1995. That was when uh, Carol Greider and, and Elizabeth Blackburn published their paper on telomerase discovered in tetrahymena. Uh, it's a pond scum organism. But it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. And even in documentaries, they've admitted that they had no. They didn't realize what an impact, what a significant discovery that was. <clears throat> but they were still focused on it. And then for the next like 10 years, there's like 
zero or one paper per year on the subject. Then when we discovered human telomerase and published that, it just skyrocketed mm -hmm. to like, I think a thousand publications a year. Either It's either a hundred or a thousand publications, but now it's definitely a thousand publications a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Nobel Prize Committee says, wow, okay, something's happened here. Who started it all? And uh, they took it back to Elizabeth Blackburn and Carol Greider and Jack Stosak. Uh, Jack Stosak was actually bef worked with Elizabeth Blackburn before uh, they discovered tetrahymena uh, telomerase. But they were involved in characterizing what the telomer is, how it has a repeated sequence of mm -hmm. TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG. Um, <clears throat> so it all, every, every big discovery, and, you know, there's no such thing in medical, biological research that one person can claim responsibility. Right. That's just unthinkable. It's just accumulation of everyone else, of what came before them, essentially. Who, who's that guy that invented the artificial heart? Uh, uh, what's the, I don't know, but yeah. Uh, his name's off the tip of my tongue. And, but, you know, he got a lot of publicity, but everybody forgot about all the people that did all the animal research right. on creating yeah. artificial hearts and animals and stuff like that, doing all kinds of study for years and years beforehand. Uh, the Jarvis heart, okay, uh, and and uh, it's it's like uh, you know if there has been a Nobel Prize or if there's going to be one, I'm sure it went to the people that actually pioneered the original work there. Mm -hmm. So, Bill, what about your best advice for the audience? Um, we talked a lot about obviously a lot of different things when it comes to telomeres and, and lengthening and shortening. What should someone right now take out of what you told them, and what should they what should they do? Oh, I I tell everybody to <clears throat> endurance exercise is one of the best things that's been shown to keep your telomeres long. Uh, ultra marathon runners have the longest telomeres of anybody. Hmm. Uh, they have longer telomeres than marathon runners. They marathon runners have longer telomeres than ten k runners, and ten k runners have longer telomeres than sedentary people. So, but it's got to be fun endurance exercise. Right. You know, the kind of person that that uh, crawls across the finish line on their hands and knees when winning a marathon, that person is probably accelerating their aging. You don't want to do that. I'm a big believer, and you know, I'm a big believer in if it stops being fun, quit. Mm -hmm. Okay, quit, quit worrying about being called a quitter. You know, I I, I say to 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 start is to win. You know, there's some slogans say to finish is to win. So some races just to finish is to be a winner. Right. I say to start is to be a winner. You know, get out there and just start the races. And this is, this is my wife's business, uh, Molly Sheridan. Uh, she she's big into promoting people to get out there and move. You know, just move because that's good for you. And and it's it's a not a well known fact, but a true fact that you burn just as many calories walking a mile as you do running a mile. Hmm. It just takes you a little longer. Right. So walking is just as good, and maybe after you walk a lot, and a few months after doing a lot of walking, you're going to suddenly can't resist running. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's things, but but it's got to be fun. You know, in ultra marathons, I mean, there's a few exceptions. And my second time that I did the Badwater Race, which is a race through Death Valley, at like 130 degree temperature, That's crazy, yeah, 35 miles. I mean, it's it's <clears throat> it's crazy, but you know, I conditioned myself. I Train, I trained in a sauna for three months and things like that. And I, when I got out there, it was easy. I had fun. I did the whole race. Great. But then then my wife got into the race the second year, the next year. And so I decided to do it again, too. And then that year, I, I had some troubles. At about uh, uh, 65 miles into the race, I started getting really bad blisters on my feet and needed repair. And I was thinking of quit. In fact, I, I did tell my crew that I was, you know, I think I'm going to just drop out. We got in a car and they started heading me back to the finish line. And we passed my wife, who's still in the race. I thought, oh, I can't stop now. So I drove, told me to take me back there. It was it was allowed in the race to, to get into a car as long as you were returned to the same place. Yeah. I got back and, and finished finished that race, but it was tough wow. just because I, I couldn't I couldn't not finish it if my wife was going to finish it. She finished it too. She finished it too, and, and she got a lot of publicity. The big news story, award winning news stories that were filmed about her doing the race uh, but that so that race probably I probably lost a few years there and then the, 
<laughs> times when I did the the, uh, uh, the the race called the Ultra the High, the one we were talking about, 138 miles in the Himalayas. I, you know, I pushed it there too beyond what I should have done, and yeah. that probably took a few years off my life. But but all the other races, you know, you know, when it's this, it's, I don't believe in killing yourself to finish a race. It's, yeah. it's got to be fun, and I, I think it only destroys your destroys your lifespan if you do that, and that's from oxidative stress and inflammation. Yeah. Um, so, so I believe that that kind of stuff is is important, but that's only one of a lot of things. Uh, two is there are, you know, quit smoking, lose weight. Those are really important things to extend your lifespan. Uh, and uh, uh, antioxidants work really, really well on mice, but they also work on humans uh, to a lesser extent, uh, and uh, especially smokers and uh, obese people. But uh, uh, it does help, and I, I recommend taking antioxidants just to help protect you against any free radical damage you have. It turns out one of the reasons why runners have longer telomeres, uh, long distance runners have longer telomeres than people that are sedentary, is because humans, unlike mice, have the ability that when we stress ourselves physically and produce more free radicals, we actually boost our antioxidant levels to mm. even higher mm. levels Interesting. so that our net oxidative stress is actually less. Mm. And uh, mice can't do that, but humans can. You, you put a mouse on a treadmill, it's going to die younger. You put a human in a situation where they're endurance and keeping it fun, they're going to live a lot longer. Okay, so but, but getting back, so the antioxidants will help with free radicals too. Omega-3 fatty acids uh, have been shown to uh, people that take omega-3 fatty acids for, have been taking it for a long time, have yeah. longer telomeres than their friends or same age that weren't. Uh, of course, there's stress. I've, I've emphasized stress. Some find some ways to reduce stress. I think Isagenix products are a really good thing for that. They're also a really good thing for uh, helping you lose weight. They got some really great weight lifts. In fact, that cleanse that I was drinking before that I, is, is a great product for weight loss. And I, I just love it. I drink it all the time. Um, the um, uh, so depression is also something that accelerates telomere shortening. Depressed people have shorter telomeres. It's a little harder to deal with, yeah. um, but uh, again, uh, there's ways to deal with it. People can talk to their doctors and stuff. When do you think we'll see the first person that lives to 140? What's, uh, what's the oldest person that's ever lived right now? Do we know? 122. 122. At least in recorded document, there, there, people argue yeah. that there's been Methuselah lived to be 900 plus years old, but, but that's uh, uh, there might be a, a whole different definition of what a calendar year was. It might have been every full moon. Uh, there's if you Google that, you'll find a lot of theories that say that that's what the calendar year was. So I don't even get into that. But the most documented, the only documented, uh, the oldest person in documented history is a woman named Jean Calment, who lived in France. She lived to be 122 years, and Apparently, only one other person has ever lived to be over 120, uh, and there are several people now that are in the age of like 115, 116. You know, I don't want to say something in case it's not true, but I did hear that one of them just died recently, hmm. and uh, uh, I don't want to say more than that because I might be getting them mixed up with somebody, one of the other ones. But the uh, 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 there is this, there's been known for a long time, a lot of people have been looking at like average populations and stuff like population, demographics, things like that, looking at how, you know, the average life, lifespan in the yeah. Roman days was only 20. Like the blue zones, I, I you know. Well, before we get into blue zones, because yeah. that's another sorry. In the Roman days, the average lifespan was 20. In the 1900s, the average lifespan was 45. Now it's close to 80. When people would look at these things and, and calculate what was the maximum lifespan for each of those, they all came up with the same thing, 125. Okay, for some reason, humans have this limit of 125 years. Hmm. Uh, and no matter, even the average lifespan, the a average lifespan is increasing, but the maximum lifespan is not increasing. Hmm. And so telomeres is the only thing that's ever come up to explain that why we have this maximum lifespan. So I like, like when I say I want to run a seven minute mile to, 130, that means I've exceeded the 125 maximum lifespan and I'm still healthy enough to run a seven minute mile. Right. 
Um, <clears throat> and I, now I forgot again where we were. No, I was we're, saying, I was just asking, when do you predict or when do you think oh, we'll first, see first. the first 130-year-old or 140-year-old person? Uh, well, let's see. I wouldn't be surprised if it's in uh, 20 years from now, okay? Because there are people that are over 110, and I believe that we will have a telomerase inducer ready for testing in a year or two or three, uh, and those people should be able to benefit from it, and I think it will have a, uh, an extension of the lifespan if, if we don't see a reversal of aging. Uh, so I think this is it's that soon that we might see somebody be 130. Now, <clears throat> to, go, to, to get, like, let's say beyond 150, I'm not certain that telomere length is enough. Mm -hmm. Keeping telomeres long is enough. I, I believe I, I'm a big supporter of Aubrey de Grey's work and others because of the fact that I, I believe that there's multiple sticks of dynamite that are burning. Mm -hmm. And even if we put that fuse out that's causing the telomeres to short, that, that stick of dynamite, what's called telomeres, that has the shortest telomeres, fuse, there's these other sticks of dynamite. And the accumulation of junk, uh, just other gene expression things, seeing that uh, certain, like CERT-T1, uh, decreases with age. Um, uh, it's just mitochondria dysfunction. Oxidative. A lot of factors. Yeah, a lot. Now there is some theories right now, and some publications, including by Dr. Ron DePino again, that telomeres might be the kingpin for all of that. Mm. Okay. That, that and and <clears throat> I think there's already been studies done by uh, um, uh, again I can't remember somebody's name, but studies done by uh, looking at uh, uh, CERT-T1 expression. Uh, with or without keeping telomeres long. And CERT-T1 doesn't decrease with uh, when you keep telomeres long. And so, so it, in that sense, telomere length is the kingpin. Um, so, so, but I, there is a chance there's gonna be other things we have to do and to, to exceed 150 might require that uh, Aubrey de Grey is extremely successful in figuring out how to remove junk from accumulation of junk uh, and uh, other things. Uh, and then, you know, we are all going to still be run over by trucks, fall off cliffs and right. things like that. And uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, that, that depresses me thinking that we might have an age for cure for aging and still somebody could come and shoot me in the head. Right. You know, but there's, there's, and you know, a lot of people just might because a lot of people aren't opposed to the cure for aging. But the, um, there are people working on things called brain uploading and Ray Kurzweil talks a lot about yeah. that uh, and uh, I know some very wealthy people that have invested very well into some of that stuff into some pretty legitimate sounding scientists uh, that ha are close to figuring out a way so that when let's say you're in a you're driving your car and all of a sudden wham you run into another car your air black your bag blows up your brains uploaded to a computer okay Wireless, you know, yeah. wirelessly uploaded to a computer by Wi-Fi, and you die, okay, in that car wreck, and then you wake up, maybe a month later or whatever, in another body, and uh, what you say, what happened? You know, I mean, how much of that? Like, how advanced you, is it right now? Is that like a fantasy or is that? Oh no, that's a reality. Than, that's that's lots of great research is going into that right now. Even Ray Kurzweil will tell you that they power of a computer is going to exceed the uh, uh, power of a human mind pretty in the next 10 years. And I think it's even less than that, but uh, there are a lot of people working on it. Again, I think they like to stay under the radar, okay, because, you know, there's too much... They get ridiculed or what? Yeah, too much ridicule about there, there must be quacks or charlatans and stuff like that. So it's like... Those kind of people, just like I was before 2008, you just want to wait until you have something to prove, right. and, and then come out of the you know woodwork. Uh, but I, I do believe, and then cryogenics. That's what I was going to ask you about next. Yeah, cryogenics is, I mean, that's really developing right now. I mean, still, still, it's questionable. Can we freeze a person and still be able to thaw that person? Okay. Now maybe you know, there's some pretty important people, some good friends of mine that have had themselves frozen because they had incurable cancers and stuff like that. Mm. And they believe that even though we can't figure out how to thaw people yet, in the future we will, and then maybe cure their diseases. 
And then there's one scientist, a guy named Greg Fay, F-A-H-Y, but it's pronounced Fay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he's, he's made tremendous strides in the world field of cryogenics. And I believe that he's going to really make the difference. And, you know, if suddenly, knock on wood, I get hit with something like cancer or something like that right now and, and uh, am, am told I have like three months to live, I'm going to sign up to have myself frozen hmm. in cryogenics because I, I have faith in Greg Fay. That, that he's going to be able to bring me back. Um, and that faith doesn't come from just talking about science. The faith comes from meeting the person and knowing what kind of person yeah. is doing. It. So he's another person. You what, kind of research, what kind of research um, has he done or what, what should people know about him? Well, uh, if I can pronounce the it, victorification, I think it's the word or some something like that. He's developed a new protocol where he's been now successful at at thawing freezing and thawing organs wow. okay. and nobody else has been able to do that uh, <clears throat> and uh, I don't really understand the technology because of the fact that I'm a little focused on my own <laughs> right but uh, uh, I, I, I let's say I understood the technology long enough that when I talked to him listened to him talked about it, I thought wow this is really great this makes sense and now I've pretty much forgotten i couldn't possibly repeat what he where said. do they store people like let's say you had a friend who has incurable cancer they freeze them where are they where do they actually reside i think there's a few places but i think the most well-known place is chronos and hmm. uh, i think that's phoenix or tucson arizona area um and uh, uh it's uh you know they just have liquid nitrogen tanks and body. sometimes people just freeze their head. Sometimes they freeze wow. their whole body. I'm a big believer in uh, I'm going to freeze my whole body. <laughs> you know, it's because I, I I don't know how much of me is me because of just my head. You know, and right. I, you know, I just don't like the idea of just freezing the only the head only. But uh, it's cheaper to freeze the head only. That's the thing. And people actually can sign up right now for the insurance plans, where they make monthly payments. Really. And. Uh, uh, when they, if they're in a hospital and they're about to die, they have a bracelet on that says, I, I'm going to be frozen. And uh, so the doctor is actually required to contact Kronos or whatever company has been doing it and tell them that we have a patient here. And Kronos will actually show up there and um, <clears throat> uh, be right there uh, by the bed and freeze the person the instant the doctor uh, says that person has died. Now, right now, it's not legal to freeze a person before they've officially been called dead. Right. Uh, but I think in the future, that should be something that should happen because I think your chances of being revived are much better if you're frozen before you're actually dead. Right. Okay. So let's, let's say you're in a coma. Right. Okay? You're close to dead. You're in a coma. Uh, that's that's the time to be frozen. So, Bill, my, my, my real question is, so what does your wife think about this? She wants to live forever. She does loves she Ooh, yeah. Does she agree? Like, um, well, I want to be frozen alongside you, or I don't know. If we, she and I have never talked about that. She, she might, she might think that's a little creepy. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's like, and I've introduced her to Greg Fay, yeah. uh, and uh, she was super impressed with the guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it might be that she's interested in now too. Yeah. You know? So what's your wife? like and her influence on your work because obviously it's a it's a big influence what's my wife like yeah. um and she she's a big support she she's a tremendously great public speaker great motivational speaker uh i mean i mean i think a lot of people would love to be like my wife because she's like 58 years old and she's probably going to shoot me for telling her age um she looks like a teenager. I mean, she's 58 years old. She's super athletic. She's she's very beautiful because she's so healthy. Yeah. Okay, and she can run these ultra marathons. She's the first American woman to ever complete that race in the Himalayas. Wow. Uh, she's she's written a book. In fact, let me plug her book. Yeah. It's called um, <clears throat> um, oh my God, what's it called uh, Running Past Midnight, uh, and it's uh, the. It's, if you abbreviate that, that's RPM <laughs> and running past midnight. And it, it's all about running past midnight is somewhat about, you know, the fact that in the ultra marathons, you learn a whole new experience of running 
all through the night. So it's a weird sensation to suddenly be running with a headlamp, look at your watch and say, wow, it's two in the morning and I'm still running? Right. I mean, that's fun. You actually get love of that. It's, a, it's addicting thing, but it's, it's it's different. But running past midnight also reflects being runner when you're an older person, okay? And and it's like, this is important. And, and she's, she like, I'll tell you, I she has spoken at People Unlimited. She has spoken at isogenics conferences. She has spoken at many places. And she just brings audiences to the, their feet. I mean, mm. it's, she she's so good at, at convincing people to get out there and move. Mm. I mean, it's it's... It, that's that's what she preaches, and it's really really good. I, I highly recommend it. She's got a business called Desert Sky Adventures, hmm. um, and uh, she just relocated. It? It's it's a company that that helps people move. I mean, it's, she doesn't she she's not a big promoter of trying to teach people how to be fast runners. She's trying to teach people how to cross the starting line. You know, get out there, enjoy nature. Right. It's yeah. Desert Sky Adventure because it's important that. There's adventure. Adventure really helps motivate exercise. Okay, and so try to find ways to combine it with adventure. I, I, I when I speak, I always tell people, get out there and follow a coyote. You know, don't follow the trail everybody else follows. See a coyote, go follow it. Drives the coyote crazy. <laughs> get to see places that nobody else ever sees. Just make sure you know how to get your find your way back. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, so adventure is really important. That's her big big thing and. You know, we, she and I got together because of our mutual interest in adventure and stuff. And we met at a race. Oh, um, really? Yeah. And uh, in Lake Tahoe, it was the Tahoe Marathons. Uh, she had not gotten into ultra marathons at first, but she was building up to it at the point. And she and I met at the expo the night before the uh, big marathons. And she told me, I, I just said, what race you're running? She said she's running the 20 mile race. And uh, I said, she asked me what race I was running. I said, I was running the uh, 72 mile race all the way around Lake Tahoe. And she's just like, oh, that's what I want to do and stuff like that. And so, you know, and, and we started finding out that our interests were the same. And yeah. she's yeah. now become a world famous ultra marathon runner. Wow. Uh, and, but, you know, don't, I don't like calling her a runner as much as an adventurer. Yeah. It's like she, she wants to be the first woman ever to run 100 miles in Antarctica. Okay. Wow. It's like, it's like, what what does she really want? She just wants to go run in Antarctica, but if she can, if she can say she's going to be the first woman to run 100 miles, then she can get sponsors to help pay the way to Antarctica. That's that's the whole deal. She wants to be the first. She wants to run to the top of uh, Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, I want to go with her. You know, it's like we're really into adventure like that. But yeah, uh, yeah but she she comes, she goes to a lot of my meetings. I spend a lot of time traveling all over like South Korea, Japan, China, New Zealand, Australia. Surprisingly, very little in European areas. Uh, but g giving presentations, talking about telomeres, and she often goes with me and presents also. And uh, uh, a lot of people remember her talks more than mine. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, she's really, really great. But, but she, helps, she, helps, she helps make me look better. You know, I guess that's what it How is. How so? Because... She is somebody like her. She wouldn't accept just anybody. Mm. As it's like the fact that that she believes in me makes everybody else believe in me too. Yeah. So, so it's I, I think that's a really great combination. Yeah. And uh, I, I I feel like every trip I go on when she's there, I do much better on those trips than if I go all by myself. Yeah. Bill, thank you for sharing. That's that is truly amazing that uh, you both do these both truly amazing individuals so we'll have to link up running past midnight um, where should we and, and Bill I appreciate all of your time this has been hugely valuable yeah. um, where should we tell people to go where should they check out check out more of my stuff yeah yeah I wish I wish I could say our website is kept up to date but it's not but um, you know when we do get more funding because we, we spend every penny on the science. Right. Uh, when we get more funding than the science needs, then we will definitely keep our website more up to date. And that's www.sierrasciences.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also www.curagingordietrying.com. Yeah. 
uh, with dashes or without no spaces. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, but uh, uh, there's another one, Sierra. You have another one, Sierra S C I dot com. Yeah, also. that's that. That works. Sierra yeah. S C I, short for sciences. Yeah. I'm also working. And I do think, you know, there's a link, a tab on there. The presentations tab is pretty interesting. I mean, it's really perfect. I mean, if people go on the presentations, they can kind of scroll through and listen to some of your past uh, presentations, which are, you know, phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. No, you're right. There, there's, and there are some things like per, I personally, every time I give a presentation, I transfer that presentation into uh, that one database mm -hmm. that's available to the public. Because I make every one of my publications available, all my slides available. I don't even ask that anybody give me recognition for them because my mission is to just spread the word. You know, and I, I, I go to talks myself sometimes and I'm surprised when I see somebody show slides uh, that I, I created and, and they don't even know because they got it from somebody else. Right. They don't even know that I was the one that created those slides. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but that's okay. I, I, I'm uh, just want, I, I'm. Uh, the only thing I want is a cure for my own aging, and my father's aging, and, and everybody else in my family. Yeah. So, Bill, thank you so much. People should check out Curing Aging, The Immortalist, Sierra Sciences, um, you know, Running Past Midnight, and uh, we'll link those up. But uh, I want to be the first one to, to thank you so much. Are right, you sure you want to end? We've only been going for three hours. I think we should keep I mean, I've going. I've lots more I could say. I have like 20 more questions that I could ask, so don't tempt me. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm up for it if you are. Well, um, then fine. Um, I was going to ask you about caloric restriction and your thoughts and, and what you think and what people maybe should or shouldn't be doing with that. I think caloric restriction is a great way to make your pet mouse live longer. <laughs> I don't think it does anything for humans. Yeah. I, 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 I believe that the benefits that people have seen from doing caloric restriction have been uh, more that they're just eating a healthier diet than the people that aren't doing caloric restriction. I mean, a healthier diet's always better better for you, but it's not going to give us the benefits that we see in mice, roundworms, fruit flies, and yeast. Mm -hmm. they, all those animals have been shown to benefit a lot from caloric restriction, but because they're super sensitive to oxidative stress. Yeah. As I mentioned, we aren't. We we have the ability to boost our antioxidant levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so so it's it's really not going to work on us that well. And and I I don't want to discourage anybody from doing it, but you know, I, I'm, I don't. You don't, I don't think the research translates? Because I read some research on mice that, you know, whatever they reduced it by twenty or thirty percent, and they lived a lot longer. But in your opinion, the um, the research doesn't translate to humans. Right, I believe that research doesn't translate to humans, and a lot of people have done it. But um, and, you know, it's, it's awful, and I, I hate saying this, but they'll stand up in front of audiences and say how healthy they look and how their sex life is so great and everything like that. And I and everybody else in the audience is saying, God, I don't think so. I wouldn't want to look like <laughs> you. You know, they, they're, 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 they don't, they don't look as healthy as they, they say they do. And, you know, I, I don't want to get sued by anybody, so I won't mention anybody's name. Yeah. I mean, I'm not really caloric restriction. The interesting part about it, and I don't, I'm, I haven't uh, researched it in full detail, but but I wonder if you do it on a maybe once a week basis just to let your body have a break. Like I, I could see an argument for that. I don't know if there's research backing that or, or what, but. Just, just, just lead a healthy diet right. all the time. A healthy diet doesn't mean restricting calories. And you know, isogenics, as I was telling you, my, my cleanse here is. Uh, when you uh, do your cleanse, do you eat regular food also or? Sometimes, I mean, uh, most times I like to cleanse, do drink. So this isn't colon cleanses, okay? This is a cleanse that gets rid of toxins in your body. Right. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, like by chelating agents and things like that. Uh, but it, it, I like to do a, a, a small cleanse every morning before I eat anything. And then mm. rest of the day, I just do whatever I want. Uh, but uh, sometimes, especially when a race is coming up and maybe I'm a few pounds overweight, stuff like that, I want to lose some weight. It's like the fastest way to lose 15 pounds I've ever seen and still be healthy. I can go out. I mean, the cleanse days that Isogenics has, I will go two full days without eating at all. Really? And never get hungry and never go brain dead, you know, which is what some of those other things, you know, you these diet plans, 
you know, you can't get any work done because you're brain dead and you can't exercise because you're yeah. too weak. But this cleanse, I'm just a big fan of the isogenic cleanse. I do not understand how it works. I just know that that in in nine days I can lose 15 pounds every single time I do it. Uh, and, what uh, made you start that in the first place? Because I see you as being very research science-based and I can see you being very skeptical of something like that. Okay. I've, I've made it clear many times that it's not always the science, it's the person. Okay. Mm. And so you're right. I would have been really skeptical about that. But I met a guy named Peter Greenlaw, okay, who was with Isogenics. And, you know, he had contacted me a few times on email trying to get me to uh, uh, listen to some of the th ideas he had. And I, I just kind of like wrote him off as just one of these other quacks and charlatans that contact me all the time trying to, you know, sell their their products and stuff. But then one time when I was flying home to Reno and I was sitting with another scientist talking about telomeres and stuff like that, he he was on the same plane just by coincidence. Maybe it was a coincidence, maybe not. But go well, because he was actually coming here for it because he was speaking at it. Oh, okay. Conference. And uh, so uh, he, he heard us talking about telomeres. And so when we got off the plane, he comes running up, taps me on the back and say, are you Bill Andrews? And I said, yeah. And he says, I'm Peter Greenlaw. And my first thought was, oh, no. You know, and I, I, we talked and stuff like that. And he talked for a few minutes. And he, he, he asked me to come and listen to his conference that he was going to give. And so I thought, OK, I'm going to go and listen to his, his presentation. Just And I'm, I'm going to correct everything he says wrong, you know, was the idea. And uh, so I, I did find out later that when he saw me actually show up, he started perspiring because he was worried that I might, he might say something that, I, that was wrong. But I was like blown away with how smart the guy was, not just about nutrition and, and stuff like but all about cell biology. And he knew all about telomeres and stuff. And he was talking about all kinds of things that were way beyond. And then when the question and answer period started, I actually moved to the front to help him answer some of the questions. You know? Really? And boy, I, he didn't need any help at all. He was he knew everything. He could that guy super impressed me, and so I told him. He he told me that he wanted me to try the cleanse. He says it's really something beyond anything. And he, I had already told him that I was a little bit concerned about the fact that I had a race coming up and I was uh, like at the time 15 pounds mm -hmm. overweight and I couldn't seem to lose it. And uh, he just said, "Bill, please try this." And so I tried it. And my wife was really shocked. She was my girlfriend at the time. Because she and I went for two training runs. One was 25 miles and the other one was 35 miles on a weekend. <clears throat> and uh, she was surprised because during the run, I just had these little tubes filled with this uh, kind of like reddish brown liquid. And that's all I was consuming. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, she, she just thought, what's it crazy? Well, it must be crazy. But, you know, it didn't have calories in it. Okay. It wasn't like a lot of calories. And I don't understand why I never ran out of energy. I was drinking this stuff. I, I've, I've speculated that this stuff works by causing my body to burn fat more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And as a result, because, because they would advertise that it gets toxins are stored in fat, gets rid of the toxins, allows your body to burn fat better. So I was wondering, maybe that's what's happening. Maybe my fat's burning. Because I was actually feeling these squiggle feelings in my stomach area. But I thought, God, the fat's actually melting away. <laughs> and... and uh, but I, I never got tired. I never I, I yeah. ran these things just like normal. I never got brain dead, and I lost 15 pounds. That's the 15 pounds that I wanted to lose. And so I've been hooked on cleanse ever since. I do not understand it. I just know it works. Every single person I've ever suggested try it. And I don't make a penny by suggesting anybody try it. But anybody who's trying to lose weight, hmm. they should try it. And, you know, people sometimes will say it's too difficult. And I, I, I will confess that when I'm trying to lose weight, maybe the first three hours of the very first day, it's a struggle, but you know, yeah. right, you know, right now. I'm so, Bill, feeling. I also wanted to. I had written down a note here. Um, when did you first meet David Kekich? Oh, well, that was a long time ago. Um, boy, I think I watched. Maybe it may have been your talk at the Manhattan Beach Project. No, 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 because. 
you know, I was the person who originally came up with the idea for the Manhattan. Oh, tell me about that. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I just was way too busy. I, you know, I got life extension to uh, uh, say they would invest and to provide a, uh, a building to have the meeting in. Yeah. And then just one day, because at the time I was still doing science, you know, and this was way, way beyond anything. And I just, I just finally just said, okay, I can't do this. I'm just too busy. I've got to find somebody else to take this over. So David Kekich and um, uh, uh, Greta Blackburn took it over. And there's another person you should interview. It's Greta Blackburn. I mean, it's like, like she's a, an incredible person. In the, she's not a scientist, but she's a, uh, she calls herself the telomere diva. But she, she's, uh, she, she's authored a book um, called uh, the, uh, Telomere Time Bomb or something like that. I, I, I'm sorry, Greta, for, for getting the name of your book. Let's see, is it, on my, it should be on my bookshelf. Uh, I, it's somewhere. But the, um, uh, so they took it over and they ran it and I became a participant in it. And it was really great because the idea of the Manhattan Beach Project was to bring all the scientists together they're trying to cure aging and get us to work together because because if for instance if i was a cancer researcher and i suddenly got cancer i wouldn't mind if anybody if somebody else found the cure for cancer at all right. i mean it's like not, it's not that important to me but we're all suffering from aging we're yeah. all going to die from aging yeah. let's not mm -hmm. compete with one another let's all work together you know and you know you've heard me promote many other people working in, in curing aging even mm -hmm. as cryogenics or whatever but the uh, an Aubrey de Grey, um, uh, so the idea was to bring us all together, so we were, would work together, and we are, we are working together. I don't know anybody that's competing to be the first to cure aging to outdo everybody else, because if we don't work together, we're never going to cure aging in our life lifetime. Right. Uh, we all have to contribute parts to the puzzle, and uh, uh, you know, as much as I can, I'm going to the SENS conference, which Aubrey de Grey hosts every year. Aubrey de Grey is our leader. Okay, without a doubt. I mean, he's a little different. He's got long hair and a beard. His lifestyle's he's got little... a great beard, yeah. But but he has brought brought the field of anti aging into the respectable field. Mm -hmm. I mean, he 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 dealt with all the people, the skeptics and stuff like that in the early days when none of us out none of us would get out there and say anything. He did it. He made it into a respectable field. And so, I'm I'm a Aubrey de Grey follower, even mm -hmm. though. He doesn't 100% believe in what I'm doing. I don't 100% believe in what he's doing, but I believe that you know. Let's make certain we support each other, just in case one of us is wrong. <laughs> uh, unless <laughs> the other one's right. Uh, it's it's it's. But he's Aubrey de Grey is definitely the leader. I don't. I can't think of anybody else that could take that claim. Uh, and uh, you know, when anybody finds a cure for aging, uh, I think Aubrey de Grey should be up there accepting the reward or whatever they get. Uh, in, in addition to whoever actually finds it, uh, but uh, who were some of out. your first calls? Who were like when you? Uh, uh, go ahead. You were asking how I met David Kekich, and I I can't remember, but I met him long before the Manhattan Beach yeah. Project. Yeah, because obviously you trust him enough because you had this idea, and then you reached out to him to help with putting well, yeah. it all together. He's he's a uh, where did I meet him? But you know, it's like he's so passionate about finding a cure for aging. Um, I might have met him through Greta Blackburn, um, but I can't remember yeah. where, when, or what. Yeah. So who were some of the first calls when you go, okay, I need to get everyone together who are the experts in curing aging. Who did you call? Who were some of the first uh, few people? Well, David Kekich, mm -hmm. uh, Greta Blackburn, Bill Falloon from Life Extension. There's another person you should interview. If you haven't, this guy's super, super passionate about curing aging. He's investing a lot into curing aging. He runs a company called Life Extension. And I hate, I don't want to do plugs, but I mean, it's the best place to buy anything to uh, extend your lifespan and health span. Life Extension has all the greatest products. Uh, and they have great doctors and scientists on board there that make it a very respectable company. I'm a big, big fan. In fact, I'm, I'm actually going to go speak at a, a life extension function in Las Vegas on Friday. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and I'm doing it for free. I've been just, I was just invited just yesterday. Uh, apparently they have a, 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 they heard I was going to be in Las Vegas or I heard they were 
I first heard they were doing it, and then I said, hey, I'm going to be in Las Vegas, and they instantly asked me if I would come and speak, and I said, sure. So, uh, uh, but that's the way we are. We, we're all working uh, together. Um, the, uh, but I'm trying to think of who else would I call. Bill Falloon is the one, he's part of the Life Extension? Yes. Okay. He's one of the founders of Life Extension, along with Saul Kent. Hmm. And Saul Kent is probably somebody else you should interview. He's a, uh, it seems like Bill Falloon has become more the active person. Saul Kent is, is, seems to be benefiting a lot from his own products. <laughs> and uh, Bill Falloon is trying to create better and better products. I, but I could be wrong. I know Bill Falloon a lot better than Saul Kent. Mm-hmm. Uh, but who else would I contact? Um, yeah. Well, of course, Aubrey de Grey. Aubrey de Grey would be one of the first. Um, uh, I'm not going in any any particular order. I'm going as I think of them. Um, yeah. I'm wondering uh, but, who was in that room, that first room, that room that, because I know when I talked to David Kekic, he was, was like some of the greatest minds in anti-aging and helping would, to cure. Ralph Merkel. Ralph Merkel is another guy. He's... He's a, a big into nanotechnology, and that's a whole other field. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would contact um, Dr. Terry Grossman. Uh, he's actually in the Immortalist. Uh, he's uh, an incredible doctor. I mean, if he's passionate about curing everybody's aging, including his own, uh, and he's a living example of, of successfully doing so. Uh, but uh, uh, Dr. Terry Grossman. Uh, Talk about nanotechnology for a second, because you said it's an interesting field. What do you see as some of the biggest promising things out there with nanotechnology? A little tiny robot that gets inside of our cells and lengthens our telomeres. That, I can't wait for that day to happen. Uh, and I think that's going to happen. You do? Uh, yeah. I, I, if we come out with a pill that lengthens your telomeres with telomerase uh, before then, uh, and the pill is really cheap, then maybe they won't do that with nanotechnology. But, you know, I, I, see, I see nanotechnology as the most wonderful field ever. I mean, we're going to have these micro little robots walking up and down our blood vessels, clearing all the plaque away. Uh, you know, it's, it's, they're going to be going through our brains and things like that. And they're, they're going to be things that, that uh, you know, we're going to be in control of. It's, uh, I mean, but... It's, it's amazing the number of things that have already been developed where people have developed small little machines that are at the atomic level that can right. do things. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm, I'm a very optimistic person because I'm a big fan of a lot of things. But I, I, I'm, I'm the first person to spot a quacker charlatan. Yeah. And, uh, and, and people come and present to me all the time. And they, they present in audiences. And I'm the first one that will just tear them to pieces. So if, if, I, if, I, if I commend somebody, you yeah. can believe it's, it's, they've, they've, they've proven themselves pretty well to me. Um, so Ralph Merkel, and there, there's other people working with Ralph that, whose names I can't remember that I... I'm what worried. are they working on now? Like what's out now with nanotechnology that is powerful? Uh, I'll say there's a few things that I... Not powerful, but uh, I, I haven't been following it recently, but the, the, the simple fact that they've got to, they've got to build, they got to, you know, you got to take baby steps before you can take big steps, yeah. and they're building the foundation, okay. And I think one of the biggest discoveries was turning a bucky ball into a bucky tube. Have you ever heard of that? Mm-mm, no. Bucky, bucky balls are where you just have carbon atoms, mm-hmm. and you can take join carbon atoms to make a sphere, a yeah. hollow sphere. Right. Well, the question was, how can you make that into a tube, okay? And, uh, you know, I remember Ralph Merkel, I was at his house one time, and he, it's like, you go into a room, and he's got 10 computers, and he's got a chair with wheels on it. He goes from computer to computer, showing you all this stuff, just amazing stuff. Uh, and he was telling me how, like, one of the biggest challenges is figuring out how to, how to make a bucky tube, you know, which is a, a tube of carbons, because... Mm-hmm. This, when, this is so microscopic and it's a tube and it's going to allow so many things to happen. It's going to be conduits for traveling electrons. It's going to be conduits for any kind of molecules big enough to fit into there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it was a frustration that they couldn't do it. Well, they've now discovered bucky tubes. They've, they, now they can make bucky tubes and there's a lot of stuff that's coming out of it. Uh, and their bucky tubes are extremely strong, much stronger than spider webs, things like that. Hmm. And they're microscopic in size. 
Uh, so imagine bucky tubes that were miles long. Think of the things we could do with those. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I think that those are going to be a lot of things that are going to help in in the nanotechnology field. But uh, Terry Grossman's another. He works a lot with uh, uh, um, Ray Kurzweil. Uh, in fact, they published a book together, and I think I have it on my shelf. I think it's called Transcend, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, or it might be in one of their other books. Let's see. Uh, the singularity is near. I, I can see the titles of the book. I can't see who the authors are, uh, but the uh, Fantastic Voyage. Uh, I've got all these books on my shelf here, but uh, uh, I, I should say that uh, there's this term that's really, really popular, and that's live long enough to live forever. And and Dr. Terry Grossman is the guy who coined that term. Mm. And and when I first met him at a conference, at I think it was UCLA or USC, and I heard that he was the one that coined him. I just decided, okay, this is a guy I wanted to know, and, and I got to know him really well. And, and uh, uh, you know, very, very smart doctor. Uh, but uh, uh, the idea of live long enough to live forever is means like stay healthy. Everybody stay healthy because, you know, maybe maybe something, if you stay healthy, you'll be alive when they find a cure for anything you have a problem with. And then stay healthy again, you'll be around for the next year and the next year. So st live long enough to live forever because eventually mm -hmm. live forever is the idea. Yeah. And I'm a big believer in that. It's going to happen. Yeah. Maybe not in our lifetime, but I'm hope I hope it does. Yeah, Bill, fantastic. Um, this is the first time I think I am out of questions for you. Oh. <laughs> what else? What else there's do you have animal, for? There's animals on this planet that have no detectable aging. You heard about that? Uh, like they're not lobsters. crab. They're not cra like lobsters. Lobsters. Lobsters was the first one, uh, and they have very low incidences of cancer too, and other diseases. Um, and so why is it that they live so long? And yeah. it's, uh, it turns out telomerase is produced in every cell of their body, not just their reproductive cells. Wow. Like telomerase is only found in our reproductive cells. That's why our children are born younger than we are. But in lobsters, it's found in all cells. Hmm. And uh, then it's been found that tortoises, humpback whales, clams, some fish, some birds, all of these have no detectable aging. They all have telomerase produced in all their cells. They have no telomere shortening, no detectable aging, and they, and they rarely get cancer and other diseases. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things I always say is I want to make us more like these lobsters. But, uh, like, uh, what is it? Charles Darwin had a pet tortoise uh, whose name was Harriet. She just died recently at 180 years old. Really? Yeah, and there's other tortoises that are alive today that are over 200 years old and mm. still healthy. Uh, people didn't. People didn't ask these questions until after Darwin's time. Okay, yeah. so so um, nobody knows how old an animal is because in most cases you have to uh, uh, be they, around they, for their birth. Yeah, they don't have rings on a tree. Well, clams do have rings on a tree. Uh, they they have these stripes on their shell that they get a new stripe every year. And now people have found clams over 500 years old. Wow. They have telomeres produced in every cell of their body. Uh, something else I want to mention was that a humpback whale was discovered and it had a harpoon in it already that looked really old and they carbon dated the harpoon found it to be 130 years old. Wow. Uh, and so, so how old was that whale? But so right now people have no idea how long most, there might be a lot of animals on this planet that have no detectable aging. Mm -hmm. It's because we never watch, you know, to see how So what can we do with that? Is there anything we can do because, okay, lobsters have... Or well, if it's only because if it's only because of the fact they produce telomerase in all their cells, the only thing we can do is look for ways to produce telomerase in all of our cells. Because telomerase, we can't eat telomerase or inject it. It's too big to get inside of our cells. Yeah. Okay. Mike Fossil is working on a way to make that possible. Um, I'm wishing him all the best of luck. I would support him in every way possible. All I can say is that we tried that ourselves. A few, uh, maybe 10 years ago with some techniques that were very, and we found it, it can get a little bit in, but not nearly as much as is needed. It's, these are systems that viruses have developed to get themselves into cells. Right. And you don't have to get a lot of, you can get one virus into maybe one in 10,000 cells in order for an infection to take place. Cause that, once it gets inside the cell, it produces so many copies of itself that gets out and then maybe 
each of those viruses have a really small chance right. of getting into cells, but they, there's enough, by numbers, they do it. So the techniques to getting into cells aren't that powerful. Yeah. And I don't know if Mike Fossil is ever going to be able to come up with an approach that's going to get us significant amounts of telomerase, but I'm the first one that's going to provide him any help that we can if yeah. uh, he does it. But he's also working on the same stuff that Liz Parrish is working on, as you know, the virus, because uh, <clears throat> that virus just happens to be able to get into cells really efficiently. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, but, that brings up the opposite is progeria patients. What have you learned from progeria patients that have helped? Well, I haven't learned that much at, at Geron Corporation. Uh, before I even got there, they had done a lot of studies and shown that progeria kids have short telomeres. So they're born with shorter telomeres. Uh, there's also been a lot of studies showing that all progeria kids also have a mutation to a protein called lamin A. And it, it, the mutant form of lamin A is called progerin. And uh, so there's people saying that progerin causes uh, progeria, not the telomeres. But what's now known, there's a lot of papers published now showing this, is that the progerin causes the short telomeres. Hmm. Okay, so, so it is short telomeres. And so even with the progerin mutation, uh, <clears throat> and by the way, we all get progerin produced in older age. Okay, so progerin is something that, that maybe helps accelerate the telomere shortening. It's a, it's a protein found in the surface of our nucleus. So we gotta, we gotta find ways to keep lamina around and not progerin. If we can lengthen telomeres in progeria kids, I think that'll be the cure for progeria hmm. uh, and other accelerated aging diseases. And then, you know, there's only 250 kids at any one time that have this disease. Right. I've met a lot of these kids. Mike Fossil has really pioneered this whole field. He, he, he goes to their fo foundation functions all the time and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, so, you know, so I was mentioning Aubrey de Grey is the leader in our field. Mike Fossil is also a leader in our field. Um, and uh, he, he's, I mean, these people have been pushing and pushing when everybody is laughing at them and acting like they're, they're quacks and charlatans, and, and they weren't. And they, they now realize they aren't. And Mike Fossil's new book, he just, he's about to publish a book. I don't know if I'm yep. allowed to mention it. Uh, it's already on. Yeah, you can mention it. He mentioned it when we talked. Okay, so, okay, so, yeah. so, so it, it's, uh, do you remember the title of it? Okay. Telomeres it's, Revolution, I think it's it, called. It's, it's Telomeres Revolution. It's already a bestseller, and it's not even, it's, it's only preprint. So you, can, you can only pre order it so mm -hmm. far. So I highly recommend everybody read that book. Yeah. I recommend they read my book too, uh, but my book is more just ex to explain the science. Mike Fossil's book, from what I've read, so I haven't finished it yet, uh, talks a lot about the history and the passions and stuff like that and gone into uh, curing aging and stuff like that. And, and of course, and rightfully so, it talks a lot about his passions, you know, because he's, he's played a major role in, in making this a respectable field. Yeah, yeah. Bill, fantastic. Anything else? <laughs> now I've run out of ideas. I'm sure if I thought... No, this has been fantastic. I think we have a, a lot for people to chew on, <laughs> to say the least. And um, just, you know, thank you so much for taking the time. And we'll link up all those resources. Okay, well, let me know if, if this helps you at all. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.